in accordance with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Executive Order of March 12, 2020, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, we are conducting this meeting virtually. To ensure public access to the deliberations of the meeting, the public may access this call through video conferencing or telephone. Following the presentation by the petitioner and questions from the commission, members of the public will have the opportunity to ask questions and provi provide public comment. Please identify yourself with name and address for the record. You can also raise your hand from your phone by dialing star nine and use star six to unmute. All video screens will be turned off with the exception of the commissioners, Delia and the current petitioner. Once the commission has acted on an application, the, peti the petitioner is free to leave the meeting. Screen sharing will not be permitted unless absolutely necessary. All votes will be taken by roll call vote. In the event of any technical difficulties, all matters on the agenda that have not been heard will automatically continue to the April 21st, 2021 NRC meeting. At this time, I would ask the commissioners to introduce themselves. Greg? Greg Higgins. Judy? Judy Zombrecker. Nick? Nick Pappas. And Sarah? Sarah Grimwood. Thank you, guys. Um, let's see, first order of business, uh, minutes. February 17th and March 3rd. Any comments or from the commissioners? I had one comment, a minor comment I sent to uh, Karen. There was a town that was missing after yes. whichever town didn't have the ash borer in it. Okay. Nick, did you have a comment? It was the same. Okay, great. So oh, I that, move that we accept the uh, minutes of the 17th of February and 3rd of March as amended. I second. All right. Judy? Aye. Greg? Aye. Nick? Aye. Sarah? Aye. And I am an aye as well. Um, director's update. Delia? Ah. You're muted. Muted. You're muted. I was trying to use the space bar. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so just a couple of things for you. Uh, Bruce Freeman phase 2B um, is resuming the multi-use trail. And <clears throat> that project um, is going to, as you know, include a construction over route two for the bridge, pedestrian bridge. Um, the wildlife culverts associated with that project is going to be constructed later this month. And the tentative schedule for um, that installation is going to be um, the weekends of April 23rd and April 30th. So that is going to mean that there's going to be traffic detours um, during those weekends. It will start at 8 p.m. Um, weekend of April 23rd, Friday night, and um, be back to normal on Friday. I mean, I'm sorry, on Monday. Um, April 26th and again April 30th to May 2nd and what those traffic detours entail will be rerouting the westbound traffic at the rotary it will go down 2A and then down um, Weatherby Street to get back onto uh, Route 2 westbound um, so that's the tentative schedule for that um, and I'm actually going to be learning a little bit more about that tomorrow um, but I just wanted to let you know that that's what the tentative schedule is. Uh, we are planning to resume our garlic mustard poll in mid-May. Um, and we're partnering with the land trust and residents to do something that is a town-wide at uh, roadsides, town conservation lands. Um, we'll be providing bags and people can call Karen to sign up for that. Um, that will be later at, towards the end of the month that that gets um, on the, on the, Karen will be taking people's calls for that. We'll put out something on news and notices, as well as putting an article in the um, journal for that. We have uh, conservation crews, crew interviews occurring later this week, um, hoping to bring them on as usual um, in mid-May. Uh, through the end of um, August. And uh, we have a few good candidates for that. So that's, that's 
that's encouraging. Um, many of you have probably seen that there are some issues at the trail uh, at Punkatasset with some flooding with the beaver. Um, we have a beaver deceiver there at the spillway um, that's being corroded and is, is causing some trail flooding. So, so Mike Callahan from Beaver Solutions is scheduled to come out tomorrow to fix that beaver deceiver. It's been in place for about 11 years and he thinks that the one of the one of the baskets to prevent beavers from damming has, has become corroded. So that should be repaired um, tomorrow and, and that trail flooding should, should be resolved at that point. Uh, Haywood Meadow, the wall extension, that is uh, the extension of the 2011 wall that, that is planned for mid-May. And I just wanted to let everybody know that uh, our new land manager that we're, you know, we just brought on board three weeks ago today is uh, doing a great job. Great. That's it. For Good me. news. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Delia. All right, we've got a couple of continuances. So if I, I could have a motion for Gomes, DEP file number 137-1558. Uh, make a motion that we uh, continue to April 21st, 2020, uh, the following notice of intent, Gomes for 1597 Monument Street, DEP file 137-1558. Second. Okay, we'll take the vote. Nick? Aye. Judy? Aye. Sarah? Aye. And Greg? Aye. And I'm aye uh, as well. And then one more continuance for Shaw, 43 Old Bedford Road. Uh, I make a motion that we continue uh, the hearing for notice of intent for Shaw, 43 Old Bedford Road, DEP file 137-1504. Second. Nick? Aye. Judy? Aye. Greg? Aye. Sarah? Aye. And I am an aye as well. All right, so our first continuance hearing tonight is Lot 2A, Puker Road. Um, who will be speaking on behalf of the applicant this evening? Uh, Mark Arnold with Goddard Consulting is here on behalf of the applicant. Hey, Mark. Hello. Okay. Um, if you can bring us up to speed on the uh, the remaining issues that look like they've been more or less buttoned up here. Yes, sir. Um, so uh, thank you again, Mark Arnold with Goddard Consulting here on behalf of the applicant. So we submitted to the, uh, the commission on March 17th, um, uh, a revised set of plans showing the uh, uh, revised invasive species management area, which includes all, all the land on, on parcel 2A around the house, but it also includes the invasive species management plan area that was part of the original um, DEP file 137-1419 for the Hosmere Meadows. Um, so this is um, now meaning that all the buffer zone and wetlands um, on lot 2A will be managed uh, under the invasive species management plan for lot 2A, um, which just makes it more contiguous with ownership um, respects. So um, the owners uh, were taking full control of that as well. And so uh, we've updated the plans to show the square footages. We've updated the invasive species management plan to um, include the, the quantities. So we've now have um, going in over 400 wetland shrubs, 100, over 100 wetland trees, over a thousand upland shrubs and uh, 299 upland trees. Um, expected, depending on, again, um, the density of, of native vegetation. There's a lot of trees on this lot, um, but again, uh, it's it's based on assuming there's nothing there and then you work your way backward and that helps with making sure they have a really dense um, planting plan, which is the goal is the 25 square feet per shrub and 100 square feet per tree. The plan also shows the updated stormwater design, um, which shows a larger Coltec system underneath the driveway. Uh, this has been reviewed by the town engineer, Justin. Uh, we got a letter dated March 31st, um, basically stating he had no further comments with the, uh, the catch basin being uh, the uh, H20 loading, uh, the revised calculation mm -hmm. showing the required areas um, and making sure the soil testing was, was done. I, I will state that the, the soil testing was actually using um, the original water depth of 16 inches. When I did the test fit, I determined it was 16 inches. When we went with Justin, we actually looked at it, it was more like 18 inches. So we used the 16 inch in the design. So in the stormwater report, you'll see the 16 inch referred to as the depth of groundwater because it's more conservative than 18 inches. Um, and so we included uh, an updated soil report 
walking uh, through those test pits, what I did independently, what we did with Justin, um, just to clarify um, where those steps came from. So we believe we provided the commission with um, the information that they were requesting uh, with regards to the stormwater and the invasive species management plan. And uh, we're looking forward to having um, any further questions answered tonight. Thank you, Mark. Um, I guess, uh, commissioners, uh, any, any follow up with this? Any questions some from your end? Not as uh, okay. I, I've just got a couple, Mark. Sure. I'm not sure. I, I just wanted to clarify uh, construction access. I, I, I guess I assume it'll be down the, the future four lot sub, subdivision roadway. Um, but just wanted to get some clarity on construction access to the lot. Um, correct. That's, that's our plan is to access down um, Hawesmere Meadows. Um, so we do it, it as, a, as a paper street and a lot with frontage, we have rights to access down yeah. that road. And our plan is to come off the end and go down there and that again <clears throat> keeps us a, a far away from the the isolated wetland um and allows us to access right where the driveway is and, and that's where the stockpile will go and everything else okay all right and and i think there was some discussion in previous meetings as well that the that the applicant would be willing to um uh, uh have a, a deed restriction uh for a uh, not oops other structures into the 50 foot no build zone and uh, I think as one of the special conditions we'd like to suggest that we'd like to see a draft of that deed restriction perhaps within six months of the issuance of the permit um, uh, I, I, I believe that we are amendable to that um, Steve Marsh is on the on the oh, great yes him. yes right. Steve Marsh here for Cuca Road yeah no we'd be amenable to that within six months absolutely yeah. thank you Steve that'd be great Love to see a draft of that. Thank you. Um, I don't think I have any necessarily follow up questions uh, beyond that. Um, Can I just uh, just say when you say deed restriction, it's it's more of a, a notice, isn't it? In the deed that it will, it's not really. A, is it a restrict? We're restricting it in the permitting process, and it's an acknowledgement of that restriction. Yes. Yes, I, I think that. Yeah, I think it's advising future owners that right. so to say notification. Yes, to, to, I mean just so so the applicant knows we're not when the deed restriction won't be in the deed. The restriction on what you can do won't be in the deed. Notification that there is a restriction would put in the deed. Yes. Yes. I, yes, and I can send you a draft copy. I, I did one. Yeah, that, send it, yeah, send it to staff. They'll they'll figure it out. That'll okay. be great. Yeah. So can I just ask one question about the access? Just, just to be sure that, um, just to be sure I'm clear on this, the, the intent is that you are going to um, amend the subdivision plan and any access for any, any access to your lot is coming off that subdivision road, correct? That is correct and that is, yes. Okay, so has there been any access from the other side of the paper street? Yes, there has been. Okay, so that is I, that? When, Yeah, when I did the soil testing, we did come in that way. Okay, so ju just as a, a heads up on that, that is going through um, the 150 foot buffer zones. So if you're going through those areas, if you're planning any kind of access through, through that area, that needs to be reviewed. Um, so hopefully Understood. whatever has happened is just in the past and sure. no, from any here future on out, access is coming off the subdivision road. Absolutely. We'll be coming right in through the subdivision road. So no further coming off the paper street. None at all. The, the, the sort of western side, there won't be any further access out that side. None at all. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Thanks for the clarification. Um, uh, going to the, anyone in the public have any comments on this application? All right, hearing none. Um, Steve, I assume you'll be okay continuing to the 21st so we can prepare an order of conditions? Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Have a great night. Yeah, you too. 
All right, next hearing, uh, 367 Cambridge Turnpike. Uh, 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 who will be talking for the applicant this evening? Hi, uh, Kyle Cormier here with Oxbow Associates, representing the client, Todd, who is also here. Hi, Kyle. Hi. Um, so the proposed project is uh, removing and replacing an existing deck and enclosing a three season porch, turning it into a four season porch. Um, there is work within the 50 foot. Uh, there's deck being removed, 38 square feet. And that is currently at 31.7 feet away from the wetland line. Um, New deck is 13 square feet and it'll be at 31, 34.1 feet away from the wetland line. And then uh, there will be deck converted into porch, 16 square feet um, with a net reduction of 25 square feet of deck within the 50 foot. And then within the 25 foot, uh, we are going to be removing uh, mulch at the request of uh, NRC staff um, to, and we're gonna be replacing it with a, a seed mix, a native seed mix, and the mulch will be moved to two no, lo, new locations along the existing driveway and uh, in the front uh, near the uh, main uh, road. Uh, and then cordwood pile uh, near the wetland line uh, is going to be moved outside of the wetland and outside the 25 foot, approximately 136 square feet of cordwood. Um, and then existing lawn is going to be converted into a naturalized area, 835 square feet um, with the native seed mix. In addition to that, phenol markers are proposed to be placed uh, along the 25 foot on existing lawn. Um, and with that being said, the, the homeowner is also, would also like to uh, propose um, invasive control instead of giving up some of this lawn area, if the commissioners would be open to that. And they do have children that do use the backyard, so they would like to keep it as much lawn area in the back as possible. Um, <clears throat> And there's also a proposed stockpile area for any materials going to be used in the deck uh, replacement and the uh, enclosure of the three season porch. And with that, uh, I'll open it up to the commission. Okay, thank you, Kyle. Uh, commissioners, any comments? Well, I noticed the stockpile is partially yeah. in the 50. Could you bring it out of the 50? Yeah, that, that should be fine. <clears throat> it, yeah, and could I you explain a little bit more about what you meant about the lawn? Uh, I, I understand children want to play in the lawn, but what, what were you suggesting to, you're going to put pheno in and do seed inside the 25? Correct. Um, but they so would, where, where would the mow line end up with, the, with this proposal? Uh, along the, the pheno marker 25 foot line. Okay. Um, but the homeowners are hoping that they could cut back some of that proposed um, naturalized area. Um, and in return, we would do some invasive species control to keep some of the lawn. Hmm. Keep some of the lawn in the 25? Correct. Okay. Would it be cut? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to understand. The phenol markers say it can't cut beyond. Yeah. So how, how does that work? If it stays as long, you wouldn't cut it? Uh, we would amend the plan to uh, allow cutting. Hmm. Okay. Well, I thought I thought the hope was try to get the, you know, get the activity out of the 25. Um, so it seems like it's it's neither here nor there in terms of you know taking the efforts to renaturalize it and then and then 
cutting it and using it as still quasi lawn area. Okay. But you yeah. don't have the you don't have tonight the proposal of what the offset would be. Correct? Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, I'm I'm asking. Uh, yeah, correct. Um, I'm just trying to see what the commission would be open to um, in regards to how much lawn per um, uh, ratio in some regard, uh, how much yard they're willing to allow us to keep and return for uh, invasive species control. So there, there is just to clarify. So there are there is lawn now within the twenty five foot. Yeah. Correct. And so you're just asking to keep some amount of that. Yes. Okay. I, I, you know, I assume you can always come back and make a proposal based on you know, taking a further look at it and working up a plan and coming back and, you know, suggesting that this is a preference versus what you have on the table today. Okay. I, I, that would make sense, you know, to kind of work through the process. Yeah. Um, and, and again, I just had, a, again, staff had a couple of quick comments that I just reiterate. I think, um, just the special condition that just to ensure that all the mulch is removed from the 25 foot no disturb zone. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and a, another, another condition or, or was really kind of speaking to the uh, 835 square foot of lawn, but if that's going to potentially change, we can, we can hold that aside. Okay. Yeah, I guess um, maybe, maybe it's, um, you know, I was thinking about the, the lawn and appreciate that, um, you know, the, my understanding is, is that the, the lawn's not in particularly good condition. Um, right. At least from my point of view as a commissioner, if the lawn is maintained being within the 25 foot no disturb zone, I would, um, I think to protect the wetlands would not want to see fertilizer or pesticides used on that portion of the lawn that close to the wetlands. So if, if, if that is something that's being proposed and as we consider it that's something that would be um, on my mind. Yeah, that along with no erosion. So if it's a poor, currently poor, in poor condition and that means there's a lot of bare soil, part of the plan for maintaining it would have to be to make sure there's no erosion. Okay. okay. Uh, any further comments from the commissioners? If not, we'll turn it over to the public. Any comments from the public? I do have one question then. It sounds like the commission is potentially amenable to the trade-off of invasives with our being able to keep some of the lawn. Um, I, I, I assume, yeah, yes, I think we are. I guess not, not seeing a plan in front of us or a proposal, it's hard to react to that, but no, I'm, I'm only asking if that's a reasonable ask and one that's that's worthwhile our, our spending the time and effort to go through and put that together. And it sounds like it's a reasonable ask. Yeah. It, I, so I, I, I'm just I'm going to just jump in from a um, from a sort of institutional knowledge standpoint. Um, it's very challenging to, you know, it's the 25 foot no disturb zone. Um, so I think it is it is challenging. Um, it's an existing condition, so it's something that is, you know, potentially grandfathered. But I think it is, it's, you know, it's a, it's a high hurdle. So I think, you know, Ed's right. It's it's possible to, to be considered, but um, it's uh, it's it's not necessarily a an easy trade off. Right. Yeah, I'm not asking for a guarantee, and I think so. That's fair enough. Response is and, 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 and I, I guess you'd be off for at least two meetings because I doubt you could get this in by Friday. Um, so I, I, it might be advisable to do a quick con uh, conversation maybe with staff just to, because uh, I think Delia is pointing out that, 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 that this is, you can use the word high hurdle, whatever, but you know, uh, it, it would be something before you spent a lot of money, you may want to just have a meet Kyle with them and and just get an idea of what you're talking about and maybe want to run it by staff so you just don't spin wheels and spend a lot of uh, engineering funds on something mm -hmm. that we probably wouldn't grant. Mm -hmm. I think staff would have an idea of where I would come in on it. I I, I think I'd let you do some, but I mean, I, I, I'd have to, 
I'd have to weigh it and see a clear advantage to doing that, you know? I appreciate the suggestion, anything to speed this process. I'm, yeah, that's I, what I'm, I'm respectful of the process, but I'd also like to be able to move quickly. You've got a through. little time and it, because it's probably two meetings away that gives you, a, you know, and it, maybe a week or so that you could discuss this with staff and know whether it's what your odds are. And then you make okay. a business decision. Okay, and is it, one so thank you thank you very much for that i do have one other ask given i understand that that portion of the plan is subject to change there are several other portions of the plan is there any i mean i i if there are concerns with that i would much prefer to understand them now so we could then respond appropriately um just to minimize the you know number of total meetings we have to go through <clears throat> I, I think you've heard the comments to date, mm -hmm. and I think that's the totality of them, Todd. Great. Okay. Thank you, Ed. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll continue to the 17th. Uh, uh, after you talk to staff, that'll be better determined. Okay. Um, 23 Warner Street, <coughs> DEP file number 137-1550. Who's here to discuss that this evening? Um, Dave Crossman from BNC Associates. Hi, Dave. How you doing? Good. Um, just a quick recap of the project. Um, Mr. Stolazzi was the applicant. He is proposing a 17 by 24 um, addition off the back left half of a duplex that he bought. Um, the area is all lawn behind the house. Um, it's, it's a weird shaped lot. It has a very narrow section to the back right corner that then opens up into a rather large um, remaining portion of the parcel that you can see down here in the bottom right. Most of the lot is in the back. Um, the work proposed is not within the 50 or 25 foot zones off the BBW. And we have the, we are close to the 100 year floodplain, but we're not working within that area. And at the last meeting, we were, we had shown the floodplain conservancy district separate as a separate line, as it was based on interpolation by the surveyor. Uh, we were asked to make the actual 100 year floodplain and the floodplain conservancy district the same. And so we took the line off that we had on the last plan and we made a note, as you can see right to the right of the uh, property there, that the floodplain conservancy district is the same. Uh, we were also asked to make a note that the the erosion controls would be surveyed into place prior to any, the beginning of any work because it is so close to the floodplain and the hay bale line or the erosion control line is the limit of work on the project. And finally, we were asked um, about some mitigation and that little area, the strip in the back it's about six feet wide at the narrow point. And right now it's currently a Japanese knotweed tunnel. And we're proposing to remove the knotweed on our property all the way back and replace it with the list of shrubs that I have up in the upper left corner. Uh, unfortunately, the, a huge area to the right of our property line is all Japanese knotweed on the neighbor's property. Um, on the left side of that passageway on that fence is lawn. That neighbor has it lawn all the way up to the fence. So there's no, once we take it out off our property, there won't be any on the left side, but we'll be fighting a constant battle with the, uh, all of the knotweed that's located on the right. So, and I guess basically that's it. Those were the three things that we were asked for. And I, I didn't, I believe we have met that criteria, hopefully. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, I, 
it uh, looks like it's uh, a fairly straightforward project. Um, I think there's a, I think staff recommends that besides the plantings, adding some native seed mix back there uh, as part of the mitigation as well. Sure, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, any questions, concerns? Okay. Uh, any comments from the public? Okay. Well, hearing none, I, I think Dave, you're good to uh, extend out to the 17th for an order conditions to be put together. Um, yes, that's fine. Okay. Okay. Very good. Thanks very much. Okay. Sorry, the 21st. I think I, I, I miswrote that in the application. Oh, the yeah, I didn't pick that up. thank you, Delia. 21st. Not next week. <laughs> next Not Saturday. Next week. <laughs> All right. That's fine. That's thank fine. you. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Middlesex School, uh, DEP file number 137-1545. Uh, looks like uh, uh, a lot of the things have been uh, kind of clarified and cleaned up and or con confirmed with uh, CPW, which is good to see. Um, and uh, I, I guess, Ryan, if you might be uh, or Steve taking the lead here to kind of just maybe summarize kind of where you're at and what's been done and that would be appreciated. I think we've covered a lot of the ground before, but a summary of kind of these issues that have been kind of closed that would be appreciated. Yeah, of course. Good evening. Thank you. And again, I'm Steve McEwen. I'm here tonight on behalf of the Middlesex School. With me is uh, Ryan Chmielewski, Senior Project Manager from Wesson and Sampson, uh, also has a background in landscape architecture. And I believe Marie Rubin is also here tonight. Uh, she's also with Weston and Sampson, has spoken to this group, and is a toxicologist. And yeah, let's, uh, let's go into what we've uh, talked to to date. The original NOI filing for this project was submitted in September of 2020. We certainly appreciate the feedback uh, to date, and we believe that what we have submitted today is an improved set of plans since the original NOI. Uh, since the original filing, we addressed a a load of comments, um, starting with the footprint of the project. We have relocated the footprint to the outside of the 50 foot buffer. We have incorporated an invasive species management and a revegetation plan. Uh, that includes a pollinator meadow. Um, we've also provided wall profiles for visual visualization, uh, impact of Lowell Road. We've conducted an additional stormwater test pits per town request and have added additional engineering controls, uh, which have satisfied all concrete engineering um, comments. Uh, we've also provided an independent third-party anal uh, alternative analysis uh, that includes infills and evaluation for synthetic turf, um, but also took a look at some organic um, alternatives. Uh, we've, we've also submitted maintenance cost comparisons uh, used at UMass uh, Lowell Organic Maintenance Program, and on a number of occasions here in the public forum have discussed uh, chemical concerns uh, ranging from SVOCs, PFAs, metals, microplastics, and uh, I think most recently we discussed uh, 6-PPD, quinone, and, uh, and coho salmon. Uh, additionally, Weston and Sampson provided a, an risk anal or, so I'm sorry, a risk evaluation of the proposed materials, which is the Mondo Ecofill uh, synthetic uh, playing surface, and that included a conservative testing recommendation, uh, which the school has agreed to incorporate uh, as part of an order of condition. Um, and then again, you know, I recognize that I'm, I'm certainly not an expert in toxicology, so um, I'm happy to turn it over to Marie here this evening to further discuss any concerns regarding uh, PFAs as, as we did receive some public comment um, since the last meeting. Um, and again, why we are proposing the Mondo Ecofill system and not an alternate surface. So um, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Um, so we are using uh, the EcoFill infill, um, which is not from rubber. It's a um, synthetic rubber that is, um, per the manufacturer, it does not contain PFAS compounds, uh, which is what the concern was. Um, we got an email recently about a uh, concern that PFAS could potentially be in the Mondo turf system and this Mondo turf system specifically does not contain PFAS. 
Um, it's specifically engineered as a clean polymer uh, without PFAS, phthalates, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon or PAHs, and it does not contain heavy metals above background. Um, the other, you know, I can go into the other comments that were in the email. Um, the email indicated uh, that total fluorine would show that the turf may have PFAS in it. Um, that total fluorine is a very inaccurate test for P PFAS in any material. Uh, fluorine is an element in the Earth's crust. So any plastic, rubber, lots of foods, uh, fluorinated drinking water, um, all contain total fluorine that is not PFAS related. Um, so, you know, total, total fluorine is not an accurate measure of PFAS um, in, in, you know, materials such as plastics or rubbers and that sort of thing. Um, there's a new uh, analysis that EPA is, is starting to try to derive. Um, I've, I've read a recent study about it. Um, called total organic fluorine. And maybe when that is finalized by EPA, that may be a more accurate measure of PFAS in other materials and in various materials. Um, Weston and Sampson as a company made the decision not to specify synthetic turf that contains or is manufactured by PFAS. Um, we reached out to all of the distributors that we work with and ask them for information about how they manufacture their products. Um, all the vendors that we specify have provided laboratory analysis of both the carpets and infills to show that their products do not contain and uh, do not contain PFAS. And they've provided written statements attesting that their carpets do not contain and are not manufactured with PFAS. Um, there were several suppliers that could not uh, provide that documentation and we no longer specify those suppliers. Um, I also took a look at the data that was provided to us um, via the email and um, it's data from a Franklin installation of a carpet, um, not a Weston and, Span and Sampson specified field. Um, from the data, it has to be an older installation because it does contain uh, perfluorooctane sulfonic acid, uh, commonly called PFOS. Um, and PFOS has been phased out by EPA in all products um, by 2015. So um, that carpet must be an older, um, an older installation. Um, and if you look at the data, um, you will see that the uh, carpet did not contain any of the other PFAS compounds that were detected in the wetland. Um, there was carpet data as well as wetland data. Um, they take, took a uh, surface water sample from the wetland um, and there were several types of PFAS detected in the wetland. Um, and most of the PFAS that was detected was not the type, the one, the single type that was detected in the carpet. This indicates that the PFAS in the wetland for the most part is likely from a different source or sources. Um, unfortunately, the problem with PFAS contamination is that it can come from a myriad of sources. Um, it's literally in thousands of household products. Um, PFAS actually is in workout clothes. It could, could be in soccer jerseys that you put your, on your children. <laughs> um, it's in dryer sheets. It's in microwave popcorn bags, um, you know, household textiles such as carpets and furnitures also have PFAS. Um, it's been found in Glide dental floss. Um, so the PFAS in the wetland could be from local septic systems uh, or a wastewater treatment plant. It could be from pesticides broadcast sprayed for triple E firefighting foam from a fire that had occurred historically in the area. Um, even rainwater in Massachusetts contains about five parts per trillion of PFAS um, as a background concentration. So the 
PFAS that was detected in the wetland near the Franklin installation really could be from anything. <gasps> and um, we at Weston and Sampson are working on cleaning up PFAS throughout New England. And um, generally we're finding it everywhere we look. We're finding it in a lot of surface water and in drinking water as well, um, which is uh, why it's our policy not to specify synthetic turf containing or manufactured with PFAS. Um, are there any additional questions about this? Any of the commissioners have any questions? I know, I, you know, I respect that we've covered um, both in terms of PFAS, particulate capture off the, off the field if it degrades, et cetera. And, and I do appreciate you, uh, you know, summarizing that response to the, to the citizens, uh, you know, concerns. Mm -hmm. I do appreciate that quick turnaround and thank you for that. Um, uh, so, and I'm sure there'll be some public comment on that, but before we get to that, uh, I th just a, a couple of issues that um, I have in, in talking to staff. Um, Dealey, I think we were talking the other day about trying to locate a couple of the, I'm not sure on the current plans if there's baseline sampling locations. I know we had talked about Ryan, you know, just establishing those prior to the construction. I just don't see if they're located on the plan or not. Sure. We, um... Uh, we talked about that, and uh, the ideal location is at the midpoint of the um, level spreaders, about five feet offset down gradient um, on each of the two level spreaders uh, discharging water from the uh, turf fields. So we'll we'll add that to the plan. Uh, so is that generally. is that one is that one sampling location, Ryan? Uh, that was uh, that was two sampling locations. Okay, so and we can talk offline about this, but I think it would be helpful to have uh, sampling locations in the drainage system and also in the groundwater. Um, and Marie, I'd be interested to hear what your thoughts are about that. Um, uh, the Fen School, when they did their testing, they they looked at um, three groundwater sampling locations. One was up gradient, more for baseline. Two were down gradient, and they had um, two that were associated with the drainage system to see what was being captured there. And th they also had a, another one for baseline that they had in the, um, the wetlands and the Concord River, which obviously this would be a Spencer tributary. So uh, maybe, you know, Ryan, you and S Steve and I and Marie can talk about what might be the most appropriate to put on for sampling locations, to, to put those on the plan. Yeah, happy to coordinate that. Okay. And then I think the, uh, well, let's see. Uh, and then, and then Delia, I think the other thing, and, and I think we've talked about this before in previous meetings about should there be some exceedances that we can, you know, in the future uh, by way of sampling rounds that it, if they exceed background levels or, or the, the MCP standards, then we could call that to your attention. And, you know, again, if, if it's coming from the turf field or the infill, um, I think, I, as I recall in the FEN, conditions, then the field would either have to be potentially the worst case removed, but at least <clears throat> further investigation in terms of why that sampling is coming <clears throat> higher than the standards. Right. Uh, uh, along, I, I, oh, go, yeah. ahead. go ahead, Judy. Go ahead, Judy. Uh, no, let, let Marie uh, answer your question. I, I don't want to interrupt that part, oh, but I, okay. I did have a question. Okay. <laughs> at the FEN school, um, the concentrations never approached yes. Um, standards. Um, they were right about background concentrations the entire time. Um, yep. So, you know, hopefully that's, yeah, that's it, what we'll see. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think that's what we expect. Is, and I think if I recall, the fence school was an older version of a field, right? Right. And they also oh. used creme rubber, which yeah. um, has a tendency to leach off some um, zinc. 
Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's really the only thing that they saw was um, some zinc concentrations. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, when we do get the data, I will um, make sure that, you know, <clears throat> I compare to background concentrations as well as do any type of risk assessment that's necessary. Yeah, I, I think we'd consider this really kind of belt and suspenders, you know, mm -hmm. but it's it's just there in, in the in the worst case, if you will. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. It's always good to know. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, oh. Judy. Yeah, I, I had a one one comment and then a question. Uh, the the comment is that um, as looking at where to place the monitoring wells, given that the fields are so close. To Lowell Road, I think it would be uh, helpful if the baseline well is located as far from Lowell Road as possible so that anything coming off of Lowell Road does not confound um, that baseline data and potentially mask uh, any issues that might be noticeable from the fields. Um, the, the question I have has to do with um, the, the um, methodology used for monitoring, you know, certainly the monitoring from Finn is a, is a good baseline, but that was done you know, a few years ago. And as we all know, analytical standards and methods significantly improve in terms of sensitivity. Uh, my question is, is what are the protocols that will be specified or used um, for monitoring the, what's coming off of the fields and for the baseline? The um, methodology actually hasn't changed since the FENS. Um, it's, it's the same EPA methodology that we use to um, analyze SVOCs and also metals. That's what we're planning. Has the detection limits improved with those methods? No, those have been um, actually very good for a long time <laughs> for those particular ones. Certainly, um, you know, things like PFAS, um, the methodology has to keep on improving um, because um, they're regulated down to the part per trillion level. And when the original regulations were put in place at the part per trillion level, the labs couldn't quite get down to that level yet. Um, mm -hmm. So that caused a lot of problems at first. Um, but now, you know, that's one that has changed and now we can get, you know, the labs can get down to the part per trillion level. But SVOCs and metals have long been analyzed in water, um, which is the media we're going to be analyzing them for. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the detection limits are, are, you know, they're definitely adequate to see it. Yeah, so, so it's basically the, the samples from the wells are, are quite clean in terms of no sediment. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yep. Thank okay. you. Yep. Um, any uh, comments from the public regarding this application? I see two questions, two hands up. Uh, Janet Miller. Go ahead, and... Janet. First of all, I'd like to thank you for responding at length to our email concerning PFAS. Um, uh, we're not so much concerned about the short chain PFAS in the turf um, in such, and I know that um, PFAS is now banned by the EPA, that I'm well aware of, um, but uh, really concerned about the polymers the long chain carbon fluoride polymers, <clears throat> which don't leach out as they are. However, they do degrade in under UV light, um, heat, moisture, etc. And they don't degrade, the, the carbon fluorine bond is really strong, that doesn't break. They break into smaller PFAS, which can leach and enter the, and enter the groundwater. And there is really no chemical analysis, I believe, that will actually measure those. So um, really want very strong assurance that there are none of these in, in, in the 
in the turf, preferably by an independent laboratory. Um, so the other uh, rebuttal to my com comment was that um, fluorine is, is you know, a fairly common element. And so not a total fluorine analysis doesn't, it cannot be translated directly to PFAS. That makes sense to me, but I would like to know, uh, you know a list of other, other fluorine compounds that might be in there. So, um, and even if um, a fraction of the <coughs> fluorine that's in the turf fields is PFAS, then uh, it could be a significant problem to contaminating the wetlands. So, um, I don't know whether they can do an independent analysis and measure all the fluorine compounds in, in the, um, especially in the cup itself. I mean, doing an independent analysis, I think is up to the town. Um, we have spoken with the suppliers and they have provided um, laboratory data that shows that there's no PFAS in the carpets or the infill. Um, and they have provided documentation as a statement indicating that they do not use PFAS to manufacture the carpets or the infill and that the carpet and the infill don't contain PFAS. So um, I'm not sure what else I can do, you know, and, you know, the town, you know, could hire somebody to do an independent study. <laughs> and, and Marie, is, just is, is there a way to test for that? So there, PFAS, of course, is a group of compounds. There's, you know, around 5,000 different PFAS compounds. Um, and as of now, we can test for about 30 PFAS compounds, and they are the most common ones that are used. Um, the, you know, there are shorter chain PFAS compounds um, that, as of now, they can't, they can't test for them. Um, however, the manufacturers are saying that they don't use PFAS in their manufacturing. So, you know, there's there's not much else that we can do except have the data that, that we have and have a statement from the manufacturers indicating that they don't use PFAS. And Maria, just, just to remind me, the, the documentation that you had provided previously from Ecofill, mm -hmm. both in regard to, I think, the infill and the carpet were, although the, although the manufacturer produced it, it was all done by ind independent laboratory, right? It wasn't in-house. It was a third-party right. independent lab that did the testing on behalf of the manufacturer. Yes, uh, it's an independent company. lab that has to do okay. the testing. Mm -hmm. Okay, just to clarify. Yep. Yes, Jen. Is there any way that you can actually verify the presence or absence of the polymeric PFAS? So this is actually what I alluded to a little while ago um, with the new study that's out there. Um, there's preliminary, um, there's a preliminary method that EPA is, is trying to develop. Um, they actually did um, a pilot study down on the Cape uh, with um, PFAS where they analyze for um, total organic uh, fluorine. So it's different than total fluorine and total fluorine is extremely non-specific because it picks up any fluorine compound and there's fluorine and everything, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so this new method that's being developed um, you know, we anticipate in the next couple of years that they'll be able to analyze for other PFAS compounds with this new um, methodology that EPA is currently developing. Okay. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been approved yet, but I expect in the next couple of years it will be. All right, thank you, Marie.
Yep. Uh, anyone else from the public? Beverly? Thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, I'm also addressing the same issue. I wanted to draw your attention to the situation in Wayland, where the Happy Hollow well is testing above the Massachusetts limit for PFAS of 20 nanograms per liter. And in the town of Easton, where three wells are testing above the legal limit. The wells that are affected in both towns are in the water capture zone of artificial turf fields. The other wells in these towns are under the legal limit. So we know correlation is not causation. We do not know whether these fields are directly responsible for the elevated levels of PFAS. And as the industry is quick to point out, PFAS chemicals are everywhere. However, it is a troubling coincidence at best, an ominous sign of things to come at worst. Currently, Wayland is studying ways to drain water from their fields out of the well catchment area or to move the wells. Easton is in the process of finding $9 million for a water treatment facility to remove the PFAS from the water. The health consequences of these chemicals are serious with the possibility of birth defects causing these towns to hand out free bottled water to pregnant women, nursing mothers, and households with young children. PFAS can damage the immune system, the thyroid, the liver, and possibly increase risks of cancer. Why would we take the risk when these chemicals are so hard to identify and so difficult to prove absent from these fields? We may be creating a problem that's more difficult to solve than the lead in Flint, Michigan's pipes. There, they only needed to replace the pipes and that was hard enough. But if we have groundwater contamination, it may be impossible to mitigate and could cost the town a fortune to remove it from our drinking water. So once again, we urge the town to insist on grass for these fields. We just don't know enough about PFAS to be sure about it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Beverly. Any other public comment? All right. This one, Sharon McGregor. Oh, I'm sorry, Sharon. I did not see your hand. Please. Thank you. That's okay. Thank you very much. Um, and, and thank you for, again, the response um, from the applicant regarding the PFAS. Very much appreciate that. I'm also part of the Grass Fields for Safe Sports group that um, you've heard from Janet and Bev this evening, and I wanted to just add a couple of things. Um, I understand that analysis was done, independent analysis, to conclude that there's no PFAS in the carpet or in the fill. But I'm questioning that because there are so many forms of PFAS. I think you said um, that we can test for only 30 of the 5,000. And so I just don't understand how we could, how the manufacturer could conclude 100% that there's no PFAS in their product. And how could an independent analysis conclude that? So that's a, a question I have, and I'd like you to answer that in a moment. But I wanted to say that um, unless we can see the manufacturer's specs on the constituents in the carpet fill, I question that there's no PFAS and I also question about what other chemical constituents there might be in there. Um, and the town should have the right to know what they are. There may be numerous constituents of concern. Nature didn't evolve with these constituents, so it will not be able to handle them. PFAS or other chemicals we will see that may be in the, present in the carpet or the fill, we'll see that their impact will show up down the road with drinking water contamination of some sort. And that's really the concern here. It's what we don't know. Hands down, there is no substitute for natural turf with respect to compatibility with our ecosystems and with respect to the services that natural turf provides to buffer and mitigate against climate change. The compatibility I'm speaking of is via the ecological interactions of natural soils and grass 
with the surrounding environment. The services are carbon, water, nutrient, and energy cycling, which arise from the ecological interactions. So these services must be aggressively protected and restored to get us back to a livable climate. The chipping away of ecological interactions like we see with this project and so many others like it. Um, the chipping away that we're seeing of the carbon, water, and nutrient energy cycles adds up to tremendous local, regional, and global impacts, now clearly evident in the collapse of Earth's ecosystems and climate. So to conclude, all projects that involve altering land should be evaluated through a biodiversity and climate screen. If this is done for Middlesex school fields, the decision will be natural turf. There would be no other decision to make. So that's what I, in my group, um, hope that you will consider and do what's right, not just for this, pro this parcel, this project, this school, but what we all need to do in all of our decisions is to put everything we do through the biodiversity and climate screen. That's what the present emergency calls for. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, and, and again, just before Marie jumps in, I, 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 as I recall, I think that uh, they had provided some laboratory testing on, you know, not only lack of PFAS, but all the, you know, heavy metals, SVOCs, et cetera. I think that's all, I, I believe, probably part of the record uh, on the website. So I, I think they've, they've done a good job in providing some of that that information again by an independent lab testing for the product they're promoting here. Uh, and again, it's, I, I think from previous meetings, I think the commission shares your concern about converting grass fields to artificial turf. Unfortunately, uh, you know, our jurisdiction is really the effect on the wetlands. And to date, I think they've, they've demonstrated uh, that there's, there's, you know, no adverse effect as of, as of the documentation they put forward from the manufacturer and the testing. So as much as we share some of those concerns you have, um, you know, there's, there's where our jurisdiction stops and where it starts. No, I understand. I understand. I, I just feel that there are lingering questions with whether all the PFAS were assessed for and the other chemical constituents and without seeing the specs from the manufacturer about what's in this, we really don't know. Yeah, but I, I think, and I'll let Marie speak to the, the more particulars, but I think they have provided a, a, a lot of information in regard to those, those elements that, that we're all concerned about, heavy metals, you know, SVOCs, VOCs, et cetera. Um, but I'll let Marie perhaps speak to it a little bit more. Sure. Um, so, the manufacturer did provide laboratory data showing that these, uh, the infill and the carpet do not contain um, PFAS and there's only 30 that can be evaluated um, or that can be detected in a lab. Um, however, those are the mostly the longer chain and some of the shorter chain PFAS that they can detect. Um, if there's none of those 30 detected, um, the shorter chain that they typically can't detect um, are like are PFAS that will break off of the longer chain over, it usually takes a long time, but <laughs> it takes a lot of degrading. So if there's no longer chain PFAS, it's unlikely that they'll be shorter chain PFAS. Um, and in addition, the manufacturer has stated that they do not use PFAS in the manufacture of their product. Um, so, you know, there's not much more I can do aside from that. Um, uh, they also provided data showing that the ecofill did not contain phthalates or polyaromatic hydrocarbons or metals um, or heavy metals above background concentrations. Um, so um, 
that's typically what we look for when we have carpet and infill um, in synthetic turf. Uh, you know, that's, <laughs> um, so they have specifically uh, engineered ecofill to be a clean product without the typical chemicals that we look for in synthetic turf. Thank you, Judy. Yeah, yeah uh, Maria. Question I have: um, So you, you refer you know, the, the the techniques for measuring PFAS, and, and, and certainly understand the limitations and the variety. Um, and the information that you've received, uh, or Western Sampson has received from the manufacturers, can they go back and say, and the material, the raw materials that are used, such as the raw materials that are used for making the polymers, mm -hmm. are chemicals that will not under the conditions that they're processed under both in terms of making the polymers and then making the materials would form PFOS or PFOS gener potentially PFOS generating compounds. Right, We're, um, the carpets are made of um, polyethylene, which is an extremely common uh, plastic uh, it's in everything. It's in your cars, you know, <laughs> it's in your furniture and that sort of thing. Um, polyethylene does not create PFAS. Um, PFAS are long chain fluorinated carbons uh, used typically um, for nonstick water repellent and um, uh, stain repellent. So it's, it's a different, they're different compounds. <laughs> um, there, there is fluorine in the carpet that's within the plastic because plastic is made with petroleum and petroleum comes from the earth and it has fluorine in it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, they're, they're different compounds. It's not gonna break down into PFAS compounds. Okay, thank you. Yep. And you could say that is true for all the remaining of the 4,700 or 990, seven, 70, sorry, you said 30, right? That you know of? Yeah. The balance the, of that in the, in the total of 5,000. Right. How would you know, how do you know that those aren't potentially part of, part of this, the constituents in the, in the carpet or fill? So PFAS is used as a non-sticking agent. And so typically it's not in the, the carpets at all. It's, it's, uh, it's a byproduct that'll stick to the outside of the carpets. Um, and um, from what I've, because I've gone back to the manufacturer several times to talk about this now, um, polyethylene does not if they use a more expensive extruder, they don't need a sticking agent at all. And so they were able to eliminate PFAS in the whole manufacturing process by using a more expensive extruder. Um, you know, that's just what I understand from the process from kind of going back and forth from with the manufacturer. Um, so they've, um, you know, based on the public's outcry, they've, you know, gone back and eliminated PFAS from their process. Thank you, Marie. Yep. All right. Uh, Is that, if I could. Okay. Sure. Um, so we, as far as we know, there, there, there will be no PFAS. We're using an artificial product in a, in the environment here that's close to the to the wetland. So we do have to think about this, of course, and we have been thinking about this in meetings, several meetings. If I, I've asked this before, and I and, and um, I guess this goes to Stephen, um, should should this product be banned by state or federal authorities? Are you willing to remove it within two? Would you would you put a restriction on the, the permitting process here to remove it within two years of that notification by the government? 
Yeah, I think that's something we would consider. And again, I've said at this meeting uh, more than once, that's why we have chosen a proven product. That's yeah, been I, 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 exactly. Exactly. I mean, I, I don't want to get on my soapbox again. It's about the artificial versus natural. We, we're over that, I think, uh, regretfully. But um, if 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 it happens, I, I would like to see a stipulation put in the in the permitting process that if it, if it happened, that you guys would voluntarily take it out. I mean, you're good stewards. I, I think you want to be good stewards, and, and and I would hope that you'd be willing to put that in there. Yeah, by by all means, please. I mean, we'll review the order of condition and and comment, but I don't. I, you haven't proposed anything that seems unrealistic. Okay. Okay. Um, the only thing, the only thing I have left left on my list, Steve, is the. Uh, I think there's seven or eight outstanding order of conditions for the Middlesex School, and I think we'd like to propose uh, having a condition here that perhaps within six months or so from issuance that we could close those out and kind of kind of bring it up to you know current. So so we have one outstanding permit at, you know moving forward. Can, can I just jump in, Ed? I, I, I'm confused why you'd need six months to, to do that. And we had one of these, I forget the idea, was it like six months or somebody else came and we, and we shortened that up. Um, I, I just don't know why you'd need six months to close these out. Because there are seven of them. So I think having it be six months is... That's <laughs> the number that are outstanding. Yeah. I think is fine. Okay, could okay. be multiple consultants. You know, they're busy. Uh, you know, I think we just want to see them closed out, just so it's brought up to snuff, and we, we can kind of move forward on a clean slate. Okay, it's, if you think it's reasonable, it just seemed a long time to me. Yeah, and for for my understanding, it as well. It's for this group to review the the certificates as well. Yeah. So the commission, so once you get everything in, the as built and the monitor, monitoring reports and everything else, then the commission will, staff will review those and make a recommendation to the commission at which point they will issue those COCs. Uh, and then that gets recorded and all of those projects just get put to bed. That's agreeable, Steve. Yeah, certainly. I, I've talked with Delia about that again today and um, and I, and I believe we understand what needs to be done. So those are those were some projects that uh, were tied to growing seasons and we've we've reached the end of those third growing seasons. So it's time to close them. Great. Thank you. Um, so I, so with that, I think we'll uh, continue out to the 21st um, for so we can prepare an order of conditions. You agreeable with that, Steve? Yeah, that'd be great. It would be okay. great to see an order of condition. OK. Very so good. just just to be just to clarify that you'll get us a plan showing those monitoring locations. Yeah, were you guys were you guys going to have a discussion just to try to come to a, an agreement on locations yes. so we can put them on a plan? Okay, yep. that'd be great. Thank you all. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Uh, moving on to new applications. Uh, Project 990Y Plainfield Road, Town of Concord. Who will be leading the discussion this evening for the applicant? Hi there. Hey, Kate, how are you? Good, thank you. Um, I'm Kate Hodges. I'm the Deputy Town Manager. And um, <clears throat> thank you for having us this evening. Um, I'm just going to introduce the town's team. Who's here? Ryan Orr, Facilities Director. Um, we also have uh, DJ Fimiani who's a recreation supervisor and Anna McEwen, who is our um, recreation director. And uh, we also have our partners of Weston and Samson here, including Jean Bollinger and Brandon Congo. And so um, just for some background, which I'm sure that you're all uh, very aware of, um, <clears throat> the town was gifted the property in 2018 from White Pond Associates. And it was fully understood that we were accepting a parcel, which was a treasure for the community, but one which was pretty deprogrammed and in need of some updates in order to conform with 
both code compliance and regulations under ADA and the Mass Ar Architectural Access Board. Uh, so the goal of the project has always been to create a space that could be used by everyone whenever they wish and um, to take steps and make a concerted effort uh, to create a more robust stormwater management system, which captures as much runoff along the hillside, both on the driveway side and the wooded hillside, um, and in order to improve the overall pond water health. So the plans, which you have seen and will see again tonight, um, come to you after a pretty lengthy study um, and a public input process. We've been working on this for almost two years now. Mm. Um, and we believe these plans um, that you're looking at really best represent our efforts, both to be compliant with the access laws and code um, and uh, to be good stewards of the resource area. Um, and we also um, try to incorporate and, and take into account a design that really fits um, the majority of the feedback that we received, um, maintaining, of course, our uh, compliance with code. So I, I want to turn it over to Jean and to um, Brandon, and uh, they have a couple of slides. Kate, thanks very much. I, I think that framed it up very well. Appreciate that. Um, and I'm going to hand it off to Brandon to just walk through a couple of drawings and really highlight the technical aspects of the project, particularly those items of, of interest to the to the commission. Um, and I just wanted to note, Delia, thank you for sending along comments, um, general comments and comments from Public Works in regard to the stormwater management system. So, uh, we'll respond to those formally and in good order with the timeline that uh, you had suggested. So there's the overall view, the illustrative plan of the project, and I'm going to hand it right off to Brandon to walk you through a couple of slides. Brandon? Great. Uh, thank you, Jean. And thank you everyone. We're excited to present this project to you this evening and uh, have some great discussions about it. Um, so as Kate had noted, this is a treasure within the community. We totally understand that and respect that. We are really focusing on stormwater management enhancements and um, water quality control through a very uh, intense, robust stormwater management system as well as uh, meeting current code requirements for accessibility throughout the entire area. Uh, the overall reservation area is about seven, 70 acres. We are working within 18 of those acres. Uh, we are working within the 25 foot no disturb and the 50 foot no build zone, as well as the 100 foot buffer. We have put forth a waiver request um, and really those are impacted only in that we are trying to provide complete access to the beach elevation from the top of the hill as well as the turnaround drop-off area that is at the bottom of the right-of-way. Um, so here uh, you'll see uh, the right-of-way which is also um, part of a DCR easement access for the boat launch uh, into White Pond and uh, the existing parking lot, which is uh, staying primarily untouched, except for that they're adding a few additional spots uh, around the uh, circulation loop uh, in and out. Um, during the peak season of use, my understanding is that uh, this upper parking lot, just because there's such limited parking down at the bottom, uh, gets quite heavily used over the last couple of years since the town has taken it over. Uh, here's the overall plan. I apologize for the quality, but uh, just uh, give a reference. I just highlighted the top of bank in red, the 25 foot no disturb zone, the 50 foot no build zone, the 100 foot buffer, as well as two areas that have been identified and um, uh, out in the field documented and put forward to the New England uh, habitat uh, areas. Uh, in there for two types of plants. Uh, so here's a zoom in of the areas that we're looking to discuss uh, specifically tonight. So you'll see really the top of bank as well as the 25 foot no disturb zone is really uh, the accessible path. There will be a seasonal temporary ADA mat that gets rolled out at the beginning of the season. And that's really to provide 
the accessibility from the end of the path down to the water over the sand. Um, within the 50 foot no build, it's just a continuation of the accessible path. And then uh, same within the 100 foot buffer. We are providing a few, what we're calling uh, nodes of rest where uh, because unfortunately due to the grade change of approximately 50 feet, we understand that um, you know there will be area, uh, reason for taking a break, resting, enjoying the views of the pond, um, whether or not it's little kids or of a uh, more mature age group, uh, just providing uh, areas where you can take a break as well as if you are in a wheelchair uh, areas to be able to pass each other. Over, just because we're trying to limit the impact to the surrounding environment, we are limiting the width of the path to the minimal requirements of ADA accessibility. Uh, outside the 50 foot no build zone, we are looking to build a wooden deck structure um, that would provide a place for uh, possibly having a lunch outside of the sand, sand area, as well as overview looks of the pond, uh, possibly uh, a shade element as well to get a little bit of break from the sun. Um, this is moving over towards the north side where you see now a, um, the turnaround area as well as the drop off access, switchback, uh, the seasonal uh, restrooms are now going to be ADA accessible through a board boardwalk system. Um, and we are trying to maintain as many trees as possible. Um, there are some trees that will have to be removed and we can talk about that in just a minute. But uh, we are providing two handicapped spots down at the bottom as well as a um, operations and maintenance emergency vehicle spot as well. This is the uh, new improved uh, stormwater system, and it's a subsurface uh, uh, collection system through chambers and leaching uh, into the soil below. Uh, what it's gonna be doing is collecting all of the runoff, uh, primarily from the drive uh, area where right now it's sort of left unchecked and unmitigated and runs directly into the pond. That won't happen anymore under this scenario. We would be using a series of uh, channel drains, trench drains along the um, continuous drive to capture the water along the way before it has too much velocity to just shoot off into the pond. It gets collected into the chamber system. We ended up having to use two sets of chambers due to the uh, wanting to minimize the impacts to the surrounding environment. So there is a chamber system within the 25 foot uh, no disturb zone uh, within the beach sand area that's already there. And uh, ultimately, if this was to ever peak above a hundred year storm, uh, it would overflow sort of in reverse from the final channel down at the bottom of the boat ramp uh, that would be the final overflow uh, of storms over 100 years. Um, we are also providing up at the top through some minor regrading uh, and reworking the asphalt around the drop, uh, the circulation at the top of the site, uh, improving a uh, naturally sandy infiltration basin that's already within the wooded area that's existing. This is the planting plan. I know it's hard to read and I apologize, uh, but um, we, when we are looking to remove um, up to, unfortunately, we had thought we had it down to seven, uh, but just through final grading and making sure and taking a conservative approach, we do believe that number can come down once we get out there uh, in construction. But from a conservative approach, we're assuming it's uh, about 14 trees, it'll be nine pine trees, uh, four oaks and one maple. Um, and we're replacing it with 65 new trees as well as 137 shrubs and a reforestation seed mix that would uh, enhance the ground plane of the forest itself. And that is really uh, as a result of 
um, wanting to eliminate erosion that occurs now along the concrete stairs that run from the path uh, upper parking lot to the lower uh, beach area and um, just naturally trying to restore the, the forest floor to a much more uh, dense environment through and provide habitat and uh, food for animals. And that, that is my uh, end of my presentation. Thank you. Um, yeah, it looks like a, a very good project. A lot of work on the access side, certainly. Um, any of the commissioners have uh, questions? I, I, I have I have a question on your on your um, hundred year calculations on your drainage in it and and I understand the aspect that you have to have some sort of a basis to work from and you're using good engineering practice. But as we noticed at the high school, when they use that, um, the system up there failed. And as it came back to us, the, uh, an independent engineer said, well, they use the correct calculation, but what happens within that is, I don't know how many, get, how many inches per 24 hours is the 100. But if you get that all in two hours, you 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 automatically incur an overflow. Have we learned anything, and have we adjusted uh, somewhat to, to, or are we expecting on these deluges that we get in August and what have you, that we will have a blow off at the bottom? Do we expect that, even though we've done it by the hundred year? So. I am, so full disclosure, the civil engineer was unable to attend this evening. Um, so I am happy to get back to you. I don't wanna put technical data uh, into his mouth and speak for him because I don't completely understand it myself. I'm happy to um, have him respond to that question. Well, I think so, we so understand it. I think we understand it. It's just that, the the words you use were the exact words that were used at the high school and 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 it and rain doesn't come spread out over the whole 20, whole 24 hours it comes could be a deluge of two hours you get if it's four inches you get all four in the two hours and the system is designed to take four over 24 hours but i get yeah, your so point greg, if, greg I, I, I might just jump in on this um that that um county access road that goes from Plainfields um, right down to the pond. Yeah, uh, was taken by the state uh, so that they could provide access, as as uh, Brandon said. Yeah, um, it is a chute for stormwater runoff, with no, with very very little protection. I, um, I feel, yeah. I know, I know, I know you do, but I'm just saying that anything that can be done here is going to be an improvement over the existing condition. No, I, I, the reason I'm bringing it up, Delia, is I do think there are gonna be times when the best of calculations are gonna fail. I just want everybody to understand that doesn't mean it won't happen. It probably will happen, but we're yep. using best engineering practices and, and we should just know that as we go forward. I yeah, can I just imagine somebody going down there after a heavy rainstorm in August and calling the town and saying your system failed. Well, it didn't fail. It it worked according to design. We just got more water, but but we can't just have dra drainage containers all the way down the hill. Right. Okay. Yeah, because my, my question was kind of around that, but rather the hundred year flood is a, a storm is looking retrospectively, and we know with climate change that those numbers are very likely going to be um, underestimating. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't know if it's possible to use a different standard, like a 200 year, um, and whether that would be feasible or not. So I do know, you know, we are following the state's stormwater management guidelines when it comes to current design standards. Um, and I do know, uh, as Greg mentioned, you know, <laughs> the, the stormwater is sort of like a bell curve. Uh, particularly on the 24 hour where, you know, there's different intensities. Now, like I said, I'm not the civil engineer and I'm happy to, hopefully he can participate in the next meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I can't speak the technical lingo, unfortunately, and I apologize that I'm not able to. That's okay. 
Um, I had a, uh, this, this is just for making sure I understand the plans. Um, we have the line of bank and then everything's measured for, back from that. How does that relate to where the water level is and how much does the water level change within White Pond? So actually uh, my environmental scientist is also on the call. Her name is Alexandra Gaspar. Uh, she was actually very instrumental in all this environmental um, impact. If she could be unmuted, she would be able to answer that question. Hello. She can, um, yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, so we are, that top of bank line you see um, was delineated by another wetland scientist that went out in the field, but we also have um, this edge of water line that's a little fainter, um, or I guess it's um, dashed. Um, so I think the water fluctuates between that edge of water line and the top of um, bank. I mean, probably it's probably not reaching the very top of the bank because we measure that as the first break in slope. Um, mm -hmm. But I would say it's fair to say anywhere between those two lines. So the project's been designed assuming using the edge of bank is where the water line is? Yeah, so actually, um, and this is one of the items that Delia had reached out to us about is we had noted a land under water impact um, mm -hmm. on our application. Um, however, this was in error because we had used any impact under the top of bank line. Um, whereas for a pond, impact to land underwater should be measured from that um, edge of water line. So technically there are zero impacts to land underwater as part of this project. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any comments from the public regarding this application? Um. Yes, Jen. Hi, yes. Um, I don't have any questions. I just wanted to comment that I've been um, a member of White Pond to, since 2016 um, and now moving into 20. I'm sorry, if you could just, I'm sorry, if you could just identify yourself for the, with an address for the record. Oh, apologies. Um, this is Jen Lutz. My address is 185 Old Pickard Road in Concord. Thanks. Sorry. Um, so yes, I've been a member of the White Pond um, community since 2016 when I was pregnant with my first. Um, and now I'm moving to 2021. I'm pregnant with my third. And um, just uh, being a member for these several years, um, I think it's a great resource for families. Um, and I'm really excited about the new changes that are being made um, personally for myself, especially the ADA accessible pathway, like strollers. Um, those stairs right now are, are very scary to walk down. <laughs> um, I'm surprised there hasn't been any um, accidents at least in my family. But anyways, I just wanted to, um, just again say I'm really excited about the plans um, and hopefully they can be passed through. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question. I can't find my hand um, thing. Uh, Carmen Jacquier? Yeah. What's your address, address, address for the record? Address. Yeah. Uh, 38 Shore Drive, White Pond Advisory Committee. Thank you. I just wondered, can you, uh, do you have anything on your plans where you can actually show what the the drains look like at the bottom of the boat road? Um, I do not, but I, I can try and describe them. Uh, so basically if you were to, um, like if you were to pull into a, a automotive garage, typically there's a trench drain at the bottom of the garage door yeah. that prevents water from coming in, but more importantly, you know, oils from going out. Uh, it's about, it's going to be about a 12 inch wide drain, um, you know, with asphalt running right up to the steel grate that runs over it, uh, encased in concrete below ground so it doesn't move, but it will uh, go across the entire width of yeah. the drive. Yeah, I believe there was a detail on the plan. Yeah, that, here's a detail of the catch basin. Right. Yeah. Oops. Sorry. There you go. There it yep. is. Uh, 
No, that's the that's the that's the manhole again. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There it is in the yeah. yeah. I mean, it, that's why. Yes, there is a detail, but it's not very visually descriptive. <laughs> I think it's over on the left hand side. That's it correct. Of that's the correct. That's the trench drain over there on the left hand side. There you go. Okay. Oh, I see yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. So what's um, visible at the surface is just the linear uh, grade grading correct. of the trench drain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a flush condition all the way across the road. Correct. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I had another question too. Um, I, I think this is a great drainage system. It's it's so needed. But there's an um, there's also the eroding from just the hillside. Um, I noticed after the um, town got the property and they took out, you know, trees that were dangerous and such like that. But even before that, that beach will rut across the whole width of it. It's coming down the hill. And also where the parking is for the fishermen, that hillside up there is very bare under the trees. And that also erodes down and it makes another runnel outside the existing blacktop. And that also has in the in the past eroded the beach and sent sand into the pond. Now I know you're going to do a lot of planting and you're going to have that path and you're going to have boulders um, and that might um, mitigate that. But if it doesn't, and if you still have water coming down that hillside and eroding the beach, do you have, would you be, would you do some more adjustments for that? Yeah, you know, I can I can take that this is Kate. Um, the the part that is over by where the fishermen park, we can't touch. It's not part of the plan and we don't have the authority to do that. And so what we tried to do is basically have everything on the park that we do have control over. Um, as far as the hillside, we've incorporated quite a few natural elements in it to try to, you know, sway the water one way or another and then capture it as it's coming down into different rain gardens and some plantings. We also have a pretty robust um, underbrush that we're gonna be having. So we're not just planting trees, but also we're planting you know, natural grasses and some other things that are gonna absorb the water as it's coming down. So um, I would say that you know the majority um, outside of the cost of, of, of asphalt or, or any type of pavement product that we use, um, we're spending a great deal of money on, on planting um, in the hopes that that'll, that'll mitigate some of this. So. I would be surprised if we didn't see a very um, vast uh, improvement. That said, um, as Greg had alluded to earlier, if we get a deluge that comes down in two hours, that's you know something that we're going to have to deal with. But I think it would be very rare for you to see that. Okay. And the um, the overview there with the wooden floor is that going to have um, a good catching for drainage? Is it going to go through slats in the floor? Um, what's under it? Yeah, so it, it is an elevated deck, so it would be wood slats, um, you know, with, uh, we haven't quite finished the design of it, but we talked about having it as potential storage area for the town uh, services uh, for the beach, um, but it would, it would be an open floor, so water would come through the deck system itself and then, you know, hit the natural ground below. Okay. And, and you think that that would not make any kind of runoff problem draining? I, I do not. Okay. If you look at the proximity of that Carmen to where the existing underground is too, we're not removing what's already there. We're just adding to it. Okay. Correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Maria? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, name and address for okay, the record. Okay, hi. Name's Maria Piasecki, and I'm an abutter, and I live at 28 Shore Drive. Um, I've got a, a couple of comments. One of them has to do with the, um, the seating areas at the switchback that are closest to our property, and I realize this now, I didn't realize it the last time when you showed those seating areas where people have a chance to rest after going back and forth. But it's 
but it turns out that my home now is the one that's the closest to the view of, <laughs> um, and the, the way the land slopes, I have the feeling that I'm going to be, that they're actually going to be looking down on me. And I'd like to request you to look at some planting there. Um, you don't show my home, but it's, it's, um, on the other side. Uh, it's on the other side. Yep. So I'm just we, trying to get there. Yep, and, no problem. Um, so we do you, have planting, uh, but we can look at adjusting the planting palette and do some more evergreen type plants. Uh, well, do you see? Do you see where you've got the sign? Where you you've got your your located bench at the water side of the switchback, yep. and it's where you've located the pedestal sign. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, well, there, and there's one further up. The, the contours of the land might help a little bit of the one further up from looking at me. <laughs> but the other one I'm a bit concerned on, and I'm wondering if there's a way to add, you, you've added a lot of pine trees um, from the further up to, to block, to add some privacy for the people uh, above us. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering if you could look at adding some hiding, you know, um, having everybody sitting sitting there looking right down at me. No, and, uh, understood. Yeah, and that, I didn't because that's twenty five feet that you're moving it towards me, and I didn't really worry about it with switchback switchback. But now that it's become a place, um, I'm thinking about it now. And another comment is I've just discovered I was looking for. Um, paving that you could use. Um, it, it turns out with all the trees coming down and all the all the paths you've got, one of the major elements we now are, have is paving, unfortunately. And there are a lot of different materials being used, bituminous, concrete, um, dust, what, what do you've got here? Um, the dust gra gravel. And I came across something called Gravel Pave 2 by Invisible Structures. Mm -hmm. um, have you, have, you used, with it. have you used it? I think I, I talked to, um, the, it's, it's, I think it was actually designed for something just like this. It's being used in nature um, places plus um, parks and play area. You know, you can park on it, but you can also walk on it. And it's excellent for ADA in a natural setting. You can, it looks just like gravel. In fact, they have a, a pathway on their website coming down um, an ADA was for a family with a handicapped child and they wanted to create a pathway through when they're using boulders, just like you have the selected gravel. It's not gravel, it's crushed stone mm -hmm. that, that works with the um, boulders that I use as a retaining wall and it has a switchback. It's an excellent product. Do you, you say you know about it? I'm familiar with it, yes. Uh, I know, um, and I was thinking you could use it more than one place and you can make it the path regular path plus the bituminous path, and then you would be having less materials. Um, and it also can use a more look as, like a stone color instead of your bituminous concrete, mm -hmm. which has a very kind of like an urban feel. Mm -hmm. um, Wait, are you able to see this? So yeah. yes. this no, is- No, that's exact. that's one of the pictures. Um, yeah, so this is actually a project that um, we we did um, similar to, to this. Um, I, I just pulled this up off of Google, but, but yeah. um, we had a project like this at, a, at another community that I worked in that was a beachfront project. And um, we actually did this. And, and what we did was we put in, um, we put in actually this crushed white stone. The problem, it, it is great. It does meet the code requirements. The problem is that um, kids and others like this because it's really pretty mm. and they either pick it up and take it home or they pick it up and bring it down to the beach to decorate their um sand castles or structures or whatever it is that they're um yeah. building and they look great almost as if they were bedazzled or bejeweled and then all of that ends up in the pond but i'm not i'm not suggesting using that one um they actually show one in which it looks just like a pebble you can pick what type they've got I don't know, 10 different types of stones you can use. And if you want to have it look like a natural place, um, it's used, you can pick something not so flashy. You can pick one that looks just like dirt. 
I mean, there's one being used. Um, it looks like a trail for horses. I don't know how they did it. And there's another one that looks just like a path in the woods. And I think the National Park Service is using this because they're, they need to provide pathways that meet ADA accessibility, but also look just as natural and just as normal as all the other paths. And I can actually email that to you that uses a different material. I can see exactly what you're saying with that white material. I, I think I'd want to play with it too. So <laughs> I, I can definitely I can definitely see that. But I'm, I'm not saying that one good thing about it is that you can pick a stone and the grid that could work naturally that looks just like gravel. And if, if you're worried about, well, you have gravel, you've got stone dust. So you might be saying that you don't want to have any gravel at all. I, I don't think that's a fair thing to say. Um, I think that we really do want, we do need to worry about the aesthetics of this, of, of this beautiful park that we have now. And it'd be really nice to have a very natural looking material. And that's why I am proposing this. I, I could email to Kate some information about it. I shared it with Carmen. I, I just shared it with her today. I just learned about this the other day um, as a possibility. I'm but I'm not to saying- Whatever use... it is you want, you want to email over, I'm happy to take a look at it and yeah. certainly get back to you, yep. And that, that would be great. And okay, of course I have another comment, but it's about the, um, the pavilion. So you there is a pavilion. The, the pavilion has, you, you point out that it's a good place for viewing. It's got a guardrail that's 48 inches high. Uh, it would be nice I, if you could think about using a rail that has, that allows you to look through it. It's very wood heavy, let's say. It's a one third, it's one third wood, two thirds opening. <laughs> it's, uh, so if a handicapped person was to sit there to get out of the sun or just get out, whatever, They'll, they're not going to see a thing looking towards the water. They're going to see a wooden rail. That's, you know, and, and I know there are other types out there that allow a greater view. I'm not saying glass or anything. There's maybe a wire or something different that are commercial grade, um, provide all the structural support you need for lateral loads or whatever. But that, would, that if you're proposing this as a way to enjoy the view, you provide those benches in the back, then you could actually see, see through it and see the water. So if you could think about that. Um, and then also the opening is facing west. And a lot of people at the end of the day are looking but, for a place to get out of the sun. If you could drop the roof line somehow so it could add shade at the end of the day, because that would be great to provide. The picnic tables used to be under the canopy of the trees. The trees are removed. At the end of the day, people used to sit there. But if you could provide that in the pavilion so that you could drop down the roof line so that it could provide shade in the late afternoon, that would be nice. So, so Maria, it would be really helpful if you can keep your comments at this meeting focused on what the NRC's jurisdiction is, okay. which is work within the 100 foot and ah. what the impacts are to the, the, the resource area. Um, if you have other comments you want no, to- No, I understand. I was, okay. I, I was Thank reading you. the report and so it talked about all of this other stuff and I thought I better put this in now because if I don't say it now, I don't know, I'm going, <laughs> I'm going right off of the report. They talked about right. it. Right. No, I totally understand. <laughs> I, I understand. So Thank, I, you, Thank you. I, <laughs> go ahead, I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Okay, so hearing none, I, I if I think staff has passed on some other comments in terms of you know following up on the 25, 50, 100, etc. So, are you comfortable pushing out to the uh, 21st or the 5th based on the, that commentary and the work necessary? Um, I I think we can hit the 21st. To be honest with you, the comments uh, that we received. Um, I think are fairly straightforward and minor overall. That's good because I was going to say twenty first. So. <laughs> All right, <laughs> good. That, All right. I'm sure that shocks every single person on this call. <laughs> okay, so so yeah. the twenty first, yeah, of course, sure. is fine. Um, just just make sure that you hit all those comments so that it's a full submittal. Yep. Um, if if it's a back and forth, it's going to kick out to the fifth. Understood. Okay. Very. Good. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you.
Thank you, Thank for you your very time. much. Thank you. All right. Um, <clears throat> next hearing, 299 Estabrook Road, uh, file number 137-1556. We'll be, we'll be discussing that this evening. That will be me. I'm Joan Dealey, and I work for um, Land Stewardship Incorporated, and I am filed this NOI on behalf of um, Dina I'm sorry, I don't quite know how to pronounce your last name. Um, Bushner Fisher. Hope I didn't say Thank that. you. Okay. Um, this is a project that involves invasive plant control on the property at 299 Estabrook Road. Um, it's, we're working on this project in conjunction with the um, Native Plant Trust. They've already done, uh, we've already done some work at this in this area heretofore, and this is a, an expansion of earlier work that's been done to ma um, manage invasive plants and uh, do some restoration to the um, fields on this property. Yeah, and, and as I understand it, um, I, I think since the initial work done here, the regs have changed. So I think the, as I understand it, the the permitting process a, a bit more complicated now in terms of meeting certain standards over 5,000 square feet of work? Uh, yes, I, uh, I've been back and forth with Delia and Karen about this project. And the last conversation we had was the con contemplation of uh, having to file an Appendix A to supplement this NOI. So I need to know what your uh, pleasure is. I'll let Delia speak to that, and given that's got a little bit more technical in nature in terms of the, the actual regs themselves. Um, because I think what we're looking at is obviously a very good project in terms of mitigation of invasives, but, I, but also it's, it's, there's some lack of you know, specifics to it as well. Okay. So I think it's, it's hard to kind of comment specifically on the, what we're seeing in front of us today. Um, and again, the hurdles that are now also imposed in regard to the change in regs. Um, Do you have specific questions about the invasive plant management plan itself? Uh, what's being done, what's being proposed to be accomplished? So, so to be honest, Joan, um, when we review this and I sent you some comments last week on it, what I had advised the commission at that time was that this was likely to continue because there were some you know, this was going to be filed as something separate. So I, I'm gonna speak for the commission yeah. here. You guys probably have not reviewed this very thoroughly um, because I, that's, that's on me. I basically said, this is likely to continue because there's some additional information that needs to be provided because this is, you know, you had filed it um, as a notice and, and, and included bordering land subject to flooding impacts. Um, it actually has BBW impacts and we were trying to figure out what those numbers were. We sent out our packets before we had resolved um, what those numbers were. Um, but um, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's well over the threshold for what DEP now looks for to have something filed as an ecological restoration project. So, you know, the Appendix A for that um, ecological restoration NOI is what is needed. Even though it's temporary impacts and it's, it's I mean, we recognize it's a huge benefit. Um, DEP just has lumped. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I've had several conversations with them about this. I think it's, unfortunate that they've taken dam removal projects and tidal restoration projects and stream daylighting projects, which are big, you know, yeah. big consequential projects. And they've included invasive species removal, which we encourage homeowners to do all the time um, and, and can have really very little impacts, but they, this is, this is their approach. And so the best that I can tell you is um, that, you know, the notice of intent that you have submitted is adequate 
um, the page that reflects the the um, the impact numbers needs to be updated so that it reflects the the BVW and Riverfront area. Um, and then the regs page that the 10.11 and 10.12, those criteria need to be addressed. Okay. So the MEPA notification and, you know, hitting all those things, we don't have downstream flooding impacts, you know, this is the project goal. These are, you know, those sorts of things. So, so I, I'm happy to work with you to, to sort of fully address what those are. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's just an unfortunate um, <laughs> part of, of, of dealing with the Wetlands Protection Act when you're, when you're doing, as Dinah is, a large scale good effort to, to invasive species removal. Um, I did send in um, a letter, uh, I mean, I sent this uh, NOI into NHESP early March, yes. realized that I haven't heard back from them. Um, so they, they, they should have responded to you. They sent us a letter and I thought they copied you on that. I can send it to you if you don't have it. I'm not finding it. Okay. I'll send that to you. Okay. Delia, just for clarity, is it, the filings that would need to be made, is that sort of, um, bo you know, sort of boilerplate thing you just do, or do, is there a, any possibility the state would say, whoa, you can't do this or something? Uh, there's and, always so, that it, and would it help if we, uh, as a commission, authorize you to write a letter in support of this so that the, the whoever is looking at this understands that we as the town would would appreciate this effort is that I, worthwhile I think, as, I think as long as the ecological restoration criteria are hit then dep won't have any issues with it okay okay you know so so their as you know their performance standard is 5000 square feet for bvw and this is on the order of 10 acres. Right. right. So <laughs> we're a little yeah. bit above. <laughs> Although the, the 10 acres, it, the project's not impacting all 10 acres. Right, okay, so let's say it's seven though, Joan. Let's, you know, I, I mean, it's I think well it's over five. Yeah. Okay, it's well over 5,000. Okay. Yeah, that it certainly is. So, so Delia, to Greg's point, it sounds like as long as the filings are done correctly and as you say hit all the salient points it, it should mean I, I did put in a plug for you Joan I, I sent an email to the circuit writer and I said here again we have a you know a homeowner who's trying to do the right thing and you know can DEP consider a reg change because yeah it was you know it was encapsulated in a letter about reg changes and this was this is another opportunity to really re-evaluate these, inv these um, invasive species removal projects. I don't, I don't believe that they belong in this dam removal title. They, they just don't belong in those. That's not the same category. Yeah. Um, it's I don't so think DEP is going to be responsive to that, but, but we're on your side on this. So <laughs> I'm not Unlike a regular NOI, this one will actually be reviewed by DEP. So, you know, they, they pick and choose. They are very, very short staffed. Um, but they did make a comment on this one that because of the amount of floodplain impact that it required a, a wildlife habitat evaluation. There is no floodplain impact, but now that they've flagged it with a comment, you know, it's it's sort of in their it's in their radar. So I don't I don't know. It's it's impossible to say what they review and what they don't review. But we can we can review it once all the correct paperwork's filled out. We can review it and approve it as the NIC independent without having to have the state approve it too. Well, remember, I mean, every every notice that you review is also reviewed by DEP. Mm -hmm. They they 
probably review one out of every 10. I'm okay. guessing five to 15, depending on their workload. Um, <clears throat> but they have mandated their review to you, um, but they have the ability to appeal any decision that the commission issues. Okay, so we can make an, a decision, they may appeal it, but we don't have to wait for their feedback. Correct, we just okay. need, that's, I mean, we like to get their feedback, mm -hmm. but, um, and, and they've been a lot better recently about providing feedback within a month. <laughs> that's, okay. that's not bad. Yeah, if it's yeah. six months before we get their feedback, we don't want to hold the applicant yeah. up. Yeah, you bet. Okay, so um, any uh, any public comment on this? Yes, this is Sarah Blum. Sarah, I, could, have, could, could you have your address for the record? Yep, my address is 736 Lowell Road, Thank Concord. You. We are abutters, my husband and I, on the back side. And we have a stream on our property, which actually runs along the edge of Miss Beekner Vischer's property. And um, we're very concerned about how this is gonna be managed, what herbicides are gonna be used and the potential for pollution because our stream runs into McCone's pond. Um. For the work that we're proposing, we use sensitive area approved chemicals. That's always glyphosate. We use the lowest possible effective concentration we can. Um, uh, glyphosate does not, is not a concern uh, in our experience with water pollution as it doesn't leach out, out of soil. It absorb, adsorbs to soil particles, so it doesn't move through soil. Um, we don't do any herbicide spraying near within a 10 foot um, buffer of any water bodies. And in that case, we would do either hand pulling or hand work of some sort. Um, I'm not really, I'm not sure which side of the property you're on. Um, Lowell Road. Sarah? Lowell uh, Road. If I'm looking at the map and I'm seeing Estabrook Road on the right side of the map, Lowell Road is oh, over there on the left. Um, I don't imagine that there would be much impact on your property from this work. Thank you for not imagining that there might not be much impact, but I guess I'd like a better assurance about that. And as we've been discussing, I mean, you all have been discussing all night, water runs downhill and 10 foot buffer from on Ms. Vischer Bickner's property, um, or Bigner Vishner's property runs downhill into the stream. And I think it's, it should be a concern for everyone. Uh, McCone's Pond runs into the rivers. And um, I, I think I would like to know how this is going to be monitored. And I wonder also, since it's been suggested earlier about having sampling locations. Uh, for this project as well, to ensure that the, the water and the wetlands and the wildlife are not impacted down gradient. Uh, I, I, I'm not quite sure how to respond to that comment, Sarah. Um, I, as, uh, we have not, uh, we've been doing it We've been doing this for 17 years and have not in the heretofore had to do any water sampling um, because it, we haven't found that to be a problem because of the way we do our work and how we um, avoid any impacts on sensitive areas. Uh, and uh, I, I, I might just I, I might just interject here. Um, sorry, Joan, just um, if you don't mind. Um, so Sarah, the, we have been doing some invasive species management at Old Calf Pasture, um, which is at the confluence, it's at Egg Rock, the confluence of um, the two rivers that form the Concord River. Um, and there's a rare violet there that we're trying to protect and, and we're 
removing glossy buckthorn. Um, and we had initially hoped to do that by hand pulling. Um, because we have mowed that for many, many, many years, we have created, you know, unbeknownst to us at the time, we have created this sort of underground forest of uh, roots that made hand pulling impossible. And so working with New England Wildflower Society, we looked at, to, looked at um, whether or not glyphosate, which is what land stewardship is proposing here at um, 299 Estbrook, whether or not that would be possible to use here. But we were obviously very concerned about whether it would get into the, the groundwater, whether it would kill the violets. And so we did a, you know, a, a, a pilot study where we had the app, we had New England wildflower stem swipe the, the, they, they took the herbicide and they, you know, applied it to the stem of buckthorn in these test plots. And they did it where they had violets and where there were no violets. And that was done in the fall. And then in the spring, they went back and looked to see what the results were and found that in all of the plots, the buckthorn was pretty well, you know, beaten down um, and the violets were fine. So that gave us confidence that there was no translocation of the, of the glyphosate from this stem swipe application um, to the violets through the root systems. So that, that gave us a level of confidence that this is, it is very much contained as you apply it. And I understand that the violets are safe, but if you are swiping things or spraying things or applying things and it's above a waterway and it rains, I'm not so much concerned about the violets living. I suppose it's whatever can go into the waterways and then affect the things that are downstream. Mm -hmm. like fish, like the turtles, like all of the wonderful waterfowl we have in Concord. And is there any proof that glycophosphates don't go into water? In the kind of work that we have done in the past and would be doing it on this property, we'd never spray glyphosate over water. I'm not, I'm not saying over water. I do believe it says that there will be some targeted foliar applications. Mm -hmm. That means spraying, I, I assume. It does. It means spraying with low volume hand pump backpack sprayers that we have very close control over. And in situations where it's warranted, we would do only hand wiping as Delia described um, in the situation with the violets. I guess we're on record. And we uh, to, we would never also never spray when there is a uh, when there when rain rain was forecast mm -hmm. yep. and be, and bees and all the other things that are that are impacted by spraying herbicides. I I find this very troubling. Um, listening to the words of support for you without I don't feel full consideration of the impact that it has on how neighbors feel about this. We all live in this one space. We all share this space. We all care about this space. And yet you've written letters, you, the Natural Resources Committee or whoever you officials are have written a letter of support for this. You've expressed verbally here tonight, public support for this. And I don't feel like it's balanced by how others feel. Well, I, 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 I think I, just to clarify, I don't think we as a commission have ever written any support for this that I'm aware of. And I, and I believe it, that it was mentioned that a letter supporting this had been sent and that verbal support has just been given in this so meeting. A, a, a letter from an abutter was 
consent and support of the application. Yeah. So, so kind of uh, the a butter at three sixty six Estabrook. No. Um, it was a direct a butter. That's that's what I. Yeah, read. it was a three sixty six. Direct it would not be because this is two ninety nine. This would be across Estabrook Road. So a, a direct a butter has written a letter of support. And, and, and certainly, um, you know, when the plan is fully developed and comes before us again, you know, again, all the, how the mitigation is done, you know, it's proximity to certain, you know, elements in the landscape and, you know, it's all gonna be specified. It's all gonna be laid out. It's all gonna be detailed on the plan and, and the protocol for handling those, you know, different conditions will all be laid out. For further review so it's you know this isn't a, a very simple blanket approval it's very specific in terms of the plan that's got to finally come before us um, in terms of how the mitigation is done and we're uh, hopefully very mindful of those considerations that you're raising today yeah and i think it's important to note and, and we certainly do take these considerations very seriously is the significant detrimental impact that invasive species is having in our community also where it's driving out native plants, it's affecting the birds, it's affecting the wildlife. So as we look at these projects, we are balancing the beneficial impact of that. You know, something like a Japanese knotweed, I don't know if that would be included in this. Um, I've seen that all the way at the northern tip of Cape Breton, Ireland, completely taking over and getting, you know, and taking over and eliminating the native species up there. So the invasive species are also a significant threat to our environment, and that's what we're seeking to control. Yeah, they sure are. <clears throat> Thank you, Judy. Um, so, I, so Joan, um, obviously got, got a little bit of work ahead, some of the filings and whatnot, so uh, I'm not sure where to extend to, but fair to say we'll, we'll, we'll and as you go with the filings, we'll we'll see in the in the future. I'm sorry, once, I, I once missed a little bit of what you said. Uh, I, I assume once you get those filings complete, based under the new regs and whatnot, we'll we'll see you back here again in the yes. near future with a yep. with a more specific plan as well. Yeah, I'll be in touch with um, Delia. Thank you. So we just need to continue to a date certain tonight. Ah. So May May fifth, Joan. Uh, Does that sound? Yeah. Yep. Okay. May 5th it is. Thank you, Joan. Thank you. All right, moving on to 11 Oxbow Road, RDA file number 21-4. Who do we have this evening? Let's see. Is, is William here? He's on the he's on the call. Yeah, William mm -hmm. Seekman. Could you unmute, unmute yourself? He is unmuted. I'm wondering yeah. if he's having technical difficulties. Ah, could be. Well, let's give him a minute. Hmm. I guess we could. I guess we could jump to the next one and come back. Yep. <laughs> Why don't we do that? Give them some time. Okay. <clears throat> let's let's hold that aside. Move to three ninety nine Lowell Road, file number one three seven dash one five four six. We'll be discussing this with the commission tonight. Oh, Julia, how are you? I, I just, uh, I'm going to recuse myself from this discussion as I've actually met with Julia um, and discussed her property and things in my, in terms of real estate. So I should just avoid being part of this. Thank you, Greg. And Julia, you are mute. Okay, sorry about that. Um, 
Well, this this is definitely going to be a continuation. I'm I'm not as prepared as I should have been. I didn't realize that we needed a certified botanist <laughs> until late last week. And we do have a proposal from Miles Connors from Parterre. We'll be working with him um, to um, help us mitigate. Um, Oh, good. You received this. Is this um, is this plan that I'm looking at on the screen? I did send this to you. I think we got today. this late late this afternoon. Oh, okay, good. I thought I hadn't, so I'm I'm glad that happened. Um, great. So, sorry. Let me just get my letter up so I can explain this. Um, are, would you like me to run through the um, first part of the proposal, which was which is already passed, or just the amendment? Is everyone familiar with? Yeah, just the amendment. I think okay. is fine. Yeah, and, okay. and again, maybe an overview because again, you'll be coming back with more specifics. So, yes, that would be yes. appreciated. Thank okay. You. So, um, what we'd like to do is it all started with these down trees that you see at the top of the screen, um, that that uh, little rectangle, that skinny rectangle that holds a, it, they, there are four or five trees that were holding a tree house and it all came down in a windstorm. And um, it's a hazard. There's a dangling tree above it. Uh, there's a lot of debris and nails and everything. We really would like to remove those. Um, and once we started thinking about it, this um, wildflower meadow that we had proposed as a part of uh, mitigating the proposed garage in the 100 foot setback area, um, we would like to extend about 40 feet back into um, our woods. Um, along this dotted line is where the existing, um, the first dotted line there is where the existing Woodland is not not that the black dotted line. Maybe I should. Could I just share my screen and and then I can use my pointer. It might be easier. Would that Go work? Oh, I can't. Okay. You should be able to share it, Julia. Okay, thank you. There we go. Um, so I'm, I'll make this very quick. So what? when we started looking at this area with the um, tree house, we realized that there were some other hazardous trees that we needed to take out. And we really would like to extend this wildflower meadow about 40 feet into um, what is now woodland. However, this whole area was at one point developed with, there's a uh, an old, foundation back in here, there was a swimming pool, there's a lot of debris, and there are just a ton of invasives. So we would like to clear about 80 feet back um, of invasives, and then from the from the 100 foot buff buffer line up to um, the wetlands up here. And at the same time, um, take out these hazardous trees, and then a handful of trees where that would shade what we would like to make um, a wildflower meadow. And then to mitigate, um, we're looking at, these are the trees that we would be taking out, uh, five to allow for the design of the, the meadow. And then um, these are either dead or damaged or this one huge pine um, is a split and it, it, it's dangerous. Um, and what we would mitigate with would be um, mountain laurel along the edge of what would now be the edge of the woods and three flowering trees. And then it, the um, 
a lot of berries, <laughs> whatever's available in the woodland area. Um, and I, I haven't counted them, but it's, it's two bushes for one tree that we're taking out. And we wanted to start as soon as possible, but we know it, that's not realistic now. So what we'll be doing is working with uh, Miles to get um, clearer on the method for removing the invasives in, in this black dotted area. Okay. Appreciate the overview um, and uh... All right, so let, let me see if there's any public comment on this, Julia. I have a-, a Oh, sure, Julia, I'm sorry. I I, I'm just curious, um, back where the woodland is proposed, um, are there trees there now or- Yes, yes, it's all woods in here and, and um, we're only taking out a very few of them, of the just damaged ones and, and we'll be leaving um, snags as well. Okay. Um, and then we'll be putting in some kind of flowering tree, just what's available, dogwood, crabapple, and or hawthorn. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, this is completely wooded from here back. A lot okay. of white pine, a lot of maple. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any so, other commissioners? Yes, uh, Sarah? so building on that question, is there going to be enough sun for the wildflower meadow to be successful? We hope so. This area is completely lawn right now. Okay. Okay. So if we take out these two trees and then these, um, we're hoping that it'll get enough eastern sun and southern sun mm -hmm. to be and successful. I, I have... Um, just out of interest, another question. So I was intrigued when I saw where the, you know, the 50 foot, 100 foot lines are on this, on this map, because the Assabet River is to the left. Yes. And yes, is it, yeah. is it, a, is it a, is it a swamp that you've got? No, it's the, a what is man -made it? ditch oh, okay. along here. Okay. Um, there's a, a few little wetlands over here but it's mainly just this ditch. And oh, thank then you. this is yeah, all that was dry <laughs> in here and the wetlands, if you look at, this is about a third of our property and it goes all the way back to the Assabet and the wetlands are, are, are way back. Yes, in, like, I over saw there. that. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Um, any public comment? All right, hearing none. So Julia, do you want to continue out to the to May 5th? Um, sure, is that the next one? No, the 21st, but I think in order to be on the 21st, you have to get things in by Friday, I believe. Okay, okay. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure that's gonna work. Yeah, that's, that's moving pretty <laughs> okay. quick. Great, okay. thank you. Okay, thank you, Julia. Yep. We'll see you soon. Okay. Well, let's see if we can come back to 11 Oxbow Road. Um, is is William? I don't see William on the uh, screen anymore. Anybody, anybody here? Doing camera, on? 11 Oxbow Road. Hi, I'm Brenda Smith. I'm the own, owner of the property. Evening, Brenda. Um, I don't know what happened to um, um, Bill. He tried Bill. to get on. He tried to get on, I guess. Yeah, it might have been technical. Okay. Yeah. So what he said to me on the phone was that um, he was going to do exactly what is in this drawing. So I don't know if you need to talk to him also at another time. Or I, 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 uh, I, I guess my perspective of is it seems like a replacement in kind. Yes. Yes. So Sounds like the sounds like it's uh, you know the pier footings. So th my only question was I, I didn't really understand what diamond pier footings are, but it sounds like they're just specific footings that are just point footings uh, as indicated in the plan. So minimal disturbance is my my interpretation of the plan. So uh, I I didn't have anything further. Do any of the commissioners have any questions concerns? 
So, Ed, are you, are you comfortable then with what you understand about peer footings that we don't have to worry about how they're going to be installed? Uh, was... Yeah, no, I, again, I, I, I guess I don't have too much concern based on the, okay. the sketch here as I read it. It seems like they're very relatively small points of impact. Okay, great. Any of, the, any of the other commissioners have comments here? No? no? Pretty straightforward. Okay, Any anyone from the public have a comment in regard to the deck replacement? Okay, well, hearing none, I think we have a... Uh... I make a motion to issue a negative determination, uh, number three with conditions one, uh, a pre-construction site visit shall be held with DNR staff and the contractor to review the erosion controls and limits of work. And two, stockpiling shall occur outside the 50-foot buffer zone. Three, after the project has been completed, the applicant shall submit a letter to the NRC stating that all work has been conducted in accordance with all conditions of this determination of applicability and any changes from the RDA shall be described. Second. Thank you, Judy. And we'll take the vote. Judy? Aye. Sarah? Aye. Nick? Aye. Greg? Aye. And I am an aye as well. Thank you, Brenda. Good luck with the project. Good luck. Thank with you very Brenda. much. All right. Uh, one revolutionary road, uh, D file number 137-1560. Who, who will be discussing this with tonight? Hi, um, I will. I mean, my name is Inga Daniels uh, with Inga Daniels Design, and I am um, here on behalf of the applicant, Elizabeth Nye. Um, I, so the, it's a one family house at the corner of Revolutionary Road and Wayside Road uh, with Moses Pond on the, um, the northern corner of the property. The entire backyard slopes down to Moses Pond, and the entire backyard is also within the 100-foot buffer. Um, the, this project, we propose to remove existing decks and steps, um, change the footprint. It will be slightly enlarged, um, adding some additional amenities, the hot tub, plunge pool, and a sauna. Um, and um, as well as uh, adding a path and a good, goodly amount of um, native um, shrubs and perennials. Um, so within the, the work within the 100 foot buffer, uh, we propose to, um, as I said, replace those decks, replace the decks and steps with the new decks and the amenities. Um, it includes on the following plan, you can see we want to, uh, we're trying to minimize the, um, the impact, um, so minimize the disturbance. Uh, so we're limiting regrading, but we do want to incorporate a bioswale um, just behind the, um, if I can point, no, I'm not able to point, um, just behind, um, are you able to, to flip to the next plan? Thank you. So you can see that just um, further down, just behind uh, the new garage, there's a small bioswale um, that will accommodate the, um, the storm runoff from the driveway. Um, and there'll be replanting as well within that uh, 100 foot buffer. Uh, we're trying to minimize the impact to the pond by keeping all of the um, disturbance as close as possible to the house. Um, like I said, keeping regrading to a minimum, um, adding improved stormwater treatment through the bioswale, um, and adding some biodiversity through the planting pallet. Um, there will be uh, an additional 246 square feet of uh, structure uh, proposed with this, um, and uh, approximately 467 square feet of shrub mitigation. Um, the, there's an additional, this may have been confusing, there's an additional um, calculation shown there for the perennial area um, that we would like to um, 
where we'd like to supplement the, um, the plantings with perennials. Um, and that is uh, within the 100 foot buffer, um, 130, sorry, 1,377 square feet. Within the 50 foot buffer, um, we are proposing, there's, a, there's a, a, a path that we're moving through the, um, through the site to um, provide some, you know, kind of a viewing area to the pond. Um, and we're trying to use the path of least resistance, the path of least um, slope. Um, so, we, you know, so we would, we need to impact it the least. Um, so we're just adding that seating area, adding the path. Um, and in order to get there again through this path of least resistance in terms of slope, uh, we are coming against the resistance of some pine saplings. So we are proposing removing some um, pine saplings um, and that area will be predominantly, and I think the, can't really see the color on this coming through, but that area will be uh, largely blueberry plantings. Um, so uh, again, to minimize the impact in this area, there's no grading proposed. Um, the only disturbance would be uh, through the actual planting. Um, and the path material would just be um, dirt with, um, you know, pine um, needles over top. Um, then within, there's, there's no work proposed within the 25 foot buffer. Okay, Th thank you. So I, I, I guess I just had a question, Delia, if you could bring that plan back up, it just seemed like maybe maybe some of that seating area down near the 25 was lipping over into the 25, maybe just by plan indication, but if that I could think, be pulled back. Yeah, that can be pulled back. I think what you're seeing is um, just the clearing of saplings, but we can restrict that to um, outside of the 25 foot. And, I, and, I, and I'm sure staff passed along, and I think you noted that earlier, the, just the reconciliation of the numbers in terms of the square footages, the planting types, et cetera. Yeah, so the what is listed in the narrative um, is the, which, which I think you're going by for the mitigation is the shrub area. Um, so that that's the, you know, that's the correct amount and that's for the shrubs. Okay. So again, that is uh, 467 square feet. And then I guess that again, and then just uh, just a clarification too. I think in some of the mitigation, some there there seem to be some selection of perhaps mitigating some invasives and perhaps not invasive. Yeah. Thank you. That was an omission. Um, we do intend to remove the multiflora rose okay. um, and the um, and it's like the buckthorn. The buckthorn, thank you. Yep. And that would also be um, through um, hand pulling through um, weed wrench. Okay. Well, thanks for clarifying that. Again, just uh, as you as you clarify that in the plans, that would be that would be great to do. Sure. Um, and then I think the only other thing that uh, just understanding the kind of construction route access and and equipment, etc that could be put on the plans and understand that more so. That is currently on the, um, the first plan that was pulled up um, from uh, prepared by Stamsky and McNary. Oh, okay, I missed that. So that will all be coming from the, the wayside road direction. You see it there. Mm. It, it is the is the pathway noted on the plan? I'm just trying. Oh yeah. Okay, yeah. I see it. Yeah. Where, where is it? It's a, It's only a four foot wide proposed plant access. Yeah, we have. I mean, okay. it's yes. We, you know, okay. we're really going to be limiting ourselves to, you know, bobcats and um, smaller, um, smaller vehicles back there. Is there noted on the plan where the mitigate with the invasive species will be removed? Um, 
it is it is not specifically noted on the plan. Yeah, that we we that would be good to to add also. Okay. And then also uh, there was mention of um, poison ivy. While we all most of us <laughs> don't like poison ivy, it is a native plant. Um, so appreciate the, the desire to remove it where it could come in contact with people, but areas where it won't um, would prefer it remain. So if that could be identified also where the poison ivy will be eradicated. Okay, yes. What is, uh, if you could, Delia, if you could put up the plan that shows the pathway down to the sitting point by the, the 25, what exists there at this, uh, that one? What exists there, Kurt, now in terms of? Um, so the, the, the bulk of this area between the 50 foot buffer and the 100 foot buffer is, um, you know, it looks like there was some trees removed. I, I'm thinking inside, excuse me, inside between the 25 and the 50 oh, is what I'm yeah. interested in. So that is, um, that is uh, in, in uh, reasonably good condition. It is um, very little understory. It is a pine overstory, um, a couple of blueberries in there already. Um, there's no path currently, if that's what you're, if that's what you're asking. Well, it's, it's woodland. It's woodlands that you're going to run this little, little Correct. path into. Correct. Although, you know, it, it, yes, it is woodlands. It is, um, barring the, um, the pine saplings, it is, um, there's no understory there, so it is. Is there is there any ability to adjust it so you, you don't come uh, right up to the 25? What what was the origin of of where you've got your sitting area? I'll call it your sitting area. Sure, we we're you know, just in looking at the uh, natural topography of the site. We identified that as uh, a flatter area while still staying out of the um, 25 foot buffer. So there's no no really grading involved here. Exactly. That was our that was our goal is to have no grading. Um, that well, uh, on the project as little grading as possible, um, and certainly no grading within that fifty foot buffer. So uh, you will at some point show how what the grading change will be. Uh, that is a little hard to read on this plan, but it is there. It's uh, kind of in that. And in that orange area, there's a kind of a thicker line showing where. No, I'm talking 25 to 50 foot buffer in, in, within the 50. There is no great change within the 50. Yeah, I'm just focusing on that area. I'm not. I'm yeah. not focusing at all outside. Um, all right. And trees to be taken down in the 25 to 50. And, uh, the only tree removals proposed are the those pine saplings. And that's limited to the pathway? That's limited to the pathway into that seating area. Yeah, okay. I just wanted that, I, that's what I imagined. I just wanted it on the record and, um, okay, I'm happy. Okay, any, any public comment on this application? Okay, so um, would you like to continue out to the 21st or to May 5th based on the, so I mentioned it, here. Yes, it sounds like um, kind of the most time intensive will be you to um, basically locate on the plan where we have the uh, poison ivy and the invasive materials. Oh, sorry, the invasive plants. Um, let's go, let's opt for the May fifth uh, date. Okay. So I'm trying to prepare that. Very good. We'll see you back then. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. All right. So other business, gaining ground, uh, 38A Virginia Road. Good evening. Hello. Nick, we have your name and address for the record. Uh, Krista Collins, 55 Highland Street. Good evening. Hi. Um, let's turn my volume. Um, so, um, for those of you who are, may not be familiar with Gaining Ground, um, it's a nonprofit um, uh, farm that grows and donates all food um, grown for hunger relief. 
um, located on the Thoreau farm. Um, and I'm a, a board member and also here tonight are Jennifer Johnson, the executive director of Gaining Ground and Elizabeth, jo uh, Elizabeth Eldon, the board president. Um, and we are here um, to talk about locating an additional hoop house um, in the area it's shown as the East Field um, on this map. And it would be um, exactly the same as hoop house three right next to it. Um, and this hoop house would be, um, so the, the area is cleared now already for, um, for crops. Um, so the hoop house would allow the farming staff to extend the growing season. Um, last year was just a knockout year at the farm. Um, over 100,000 pounds of food were grown and donated. So um, by using these indoor growing techniques, they really can um, amplify the impact of the organization. Um, so um, the, the, there's an on-site well, and this would also be serviced by electricity. We're, um, we're in a little bit of a conundrum as far as the building department. Um, we've been sort of getting mixed messages about, um, about the, um, whether or not a building permit is required, and Elizabeth has been um, communicating with the building department and trying to get some clarity on that. So, but we figured we would go through the NRC process at the same time. And um, the, the, the hoop house is being funded by, partly by a, a grant from the state um, and has to be, the money has to be spent by June 30th. Um, so right now the, um, the, uh, the, the uh, manufacturer is, is, is ready to deliver and install the hoop house in April um, if we can get all of our ducks in a row. Okay, thank you. Yeah, obviously, obviously great work, great project. Um, I, I only had one quick question in regard to just, just the, I think it's a generic plan for the hoop houses. Just want to confirm that the foundations proposed would just be simple, the simple pier foundation option, right? I, I, I assume there's no slab being cast. Yeah, there, so. no, 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 yeah. it's considered a temporary structure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Sarah. I just had a question about how, how many uh, square feet the hoop house is. It's um, approximately, it's just under 3,000 square feet. Okay, thank you. And you say it's, it, it, it's in the 100 foot buffer. How close is it? Do, do, did, any, did you have any idea how close it is to the well? Yeah, and I apologize because I, um, I went, was digging through emails just earlier this evening and found that there was a, um, a delineation from back, um, I guess it was last summer when the um, pavilion was installed. Um, and I can actually share that. Well, is it that outside of 50 feet? Is it more than 50 feet away? Yes. And then it's stop. Good. Just, okay. just stop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just didn't want to get caught doing something we'd regret. <laughs> okay. Any, uh, any other comments from the commissioners? And if not, any comments from the public? I make All a motion right. to I make a motion to approve the hoop house on the gaining ground property. I second that. Thank you, so, Judy. So, oh, um, you can, I, can I just make a recommendation that um, I know, Krista, we had talked about this, but the plans show two different options of slab or tie downs. Um, so, so uh, perhaps the motion to approve is based on ah. um, no slab. I amend my motion accordingly. And I re second that. Thank you, Judy. And we'll take the vote. Nick? Sarah? Aye. Judy? Aye. Greg? Aye. And I'm an I as well. Thank you, Krista. Thank you very much. Good luck with you. The house and the good We've luck. acted like good ducks. We're in, we're in, we've got your ducks <laughs> yes. lined up. Some, some of the ducks are in the row now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, looks like we've got uh, administrative approval. If I got it um, right. So I'm, I'm gonna be really quick, but I realized as I'm, I'm, I'm getting up my plans to talk to you about this administrative approval that I forgot to tell you about probably the most important thing that I wanted to update you on tonight was this Madison Field reroute 
Um, so can I can I tell sure. you about that? Please. That yeah. is my opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, <laughs> um, Madison Fields has that main through trail, um, and we're closing that off to allow bobolink a better nesting oh, good. ability. Yeah. Um, and I, I had a plan up and it has disappeared. So I will find that again. But in the meantime, <coughs> um, this is 82 Shore Drive. So she has three trees. They're quite small. Um, she's looking to have them removed. Uh, they are within the, right on the line with a hundred foot. This is another one here. Um, they are in the outer, in this location. We're not sure. You're not showing. You're not here. sharing. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm I'm <laughs> jumping around and seeing all these things <laughs> on the screen. <laughs> Good God. It That's is. all right. I did that last week on a seminar with like 150 people. Oh, jeez. Sharing my screen. <laughs> You have a much smaller audience tonight. Yeah. <laughs> but okay. no less critical. Yes. That's right. Well, I don't just know about you, that, Greg. Greg. It's just you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's the 50, here's the 100, here's the homeowner's house, tree one, tree two, tree three. They're all small. They are on the line or just in the outer buffer zone. Um, we did not see any issues with their removal. And so recommending that as an administrative approval. Sure, don't, don't see any real issues. Anyone have any okay. issues here? Um, no issues, but I just wanted to comment um, for the minutes, I guess, that I noticed it must have been on the agenda. You had a different name to what's in the... Um, yes, I, I, I'm not yeah. sure what happened with that. So, so we had a, a violator oh, yeah. who, um, hmm. yeah, somehow turned into the administrative approval. So, okay. when so just, was, it just was just clarify. a typo. Yes. Okay. So, yes, um, it, it's Boily is the is the yeah. oh, it is Boily. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ah. Okay. So let me okay. just really quickly find. Um, can you see that? Yeah. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Madison Field parking lot is here. Main trail in. And you would come through the field here and do it across That's fields right. mm -hmm. along this route. And it's a really well-traveled. It's been like this for at least 15 years, 20. I, I don't know how long. Probably as long as Madison Field has been town owned. Um, this area is what has been historically farmed. Um, and in the past few years, I'd say five, this area is what has is what has been farmed by um, Jerry Cup for sunflowers. Oh. So, you know, this has been a field that Bobolink historically nest at um we've never had a good number we've never had a good count of how many bobolink are here i always go out to try to find out around this time of year in the next month you know last year i i observed at least five males and one female you know in this area up here so i it's i think it's you know it's obviously very good nesting habitat for them. Um, I think the, having the fields in this location and the trail for dogs going through here has caused some maybe discrepancy, not discrepancies, but some discordancy for the bobolink to be able to nest within this whole area. So what we decided to do as a pilot was to close off this trail to try to see if if this portion of the fields could be successfully used by bobolink as nesting habitat um, 
walkers would still be able to come through here for through field trail access. They'd still be able to do the perimeter trail along this route here. Um, so we've put up the fencing here that just says trail closed. Please try going these directions. Here the same thing and put up signage here. This is the way to go for the through field trail access and feel free to go around in, in these sure. directions. Sure. Yeah. Um, we, we brought this up, the conservation coffee yesterday. Um, Will, the new lands manager and I put these signs up um, yesterday as well. So we're just sort of trying this as a pilot, um, but we wanted to socialize that with the conservation coffee, but also just to let you guys know that this is being tried as a pilot. Um, and hopefully it, it, it will work in, in getting more bobolink nesting in, in, in the area. That would be great. So if you hear any feedback from people talking about, I'm, I'm seeing more bobolink, I'm seeing more females. I think I've got some nesting females in, in this area. Um, have them, you know, let us know about that because we'd like to know whether it's working. And, and Delia, how long would the uh, trail want to be closed to, you know, help the nesting habitat here? Is it? So if, if this is, successful you know if this trail route is successful then i would say we close this off in perpetuity yeah permanently yeah. right yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. but if it's if it's not if this doesn't make a difference then we can open this back up again you know we've right. just put up wooden stakes with but you think you'd want to give it a couple of years uh, yeah. a couple of um, would. cycles wouldn't you to to verify your it seems common sense to me. I don't. I don't. I, I've never got inside a bobolink's head, but it, it seems that they'd like a bigger field than a smaller field with dogs running by them. Right. I mean, I think at least a season, if not two, mm -hmm. would be pretty good information about how well this is going to work for them. Right. Um, Will the land good. manager be kind of monitoring the situation uh, to see at the bottom you know, if it does seem to increase bobolink? So he's not a birder yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> but, he, but he's home reading right now. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so he just took his arborist exam on Friday. That was, that's, hopefully that's off his list. And now he's on to his birding stuff. No, he's I don't he's know, being great. a birder is a pretty tough, uh, especially in this community, to call yourself a birder is a pretty high hurdle. <laughs> It is a very high hurdle, but it's also, you know, some of it is really a bobolink sound. It just is like, it's such a burbling waterfall yeah. sound. Oh, yeah. And there's, yeah. so, you know, my husband calls them, you know, probably this is not PC, but he calls them, he used to call them, I don't know if he does now, but Dennis Rodman birds, because they have <laughs> that really yellow, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, at the yeah. top and they're you know they're kind of yeah yeah so tattoos <laughs> very <Yeah>. distinct <laughs> they're very distinct birds they're easily identifiable so um deciding whether or not they're nesting is a little bit more challenging but uh, i think he's he's uh, certainly capable of of learning that and any feedback from you know i see amity mickey i see that you're on the call um, uh, Mickey is one of our recent trail stewards and um, uh, has attended a lot of NRC meetings and trail meetings and is also a biologist. So maybe is also a birder. Who knows? There you go. Yeah. <laughs> maybe I, I'm not putting you on the spot, Mickey, but feel free to jump in. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I will. I will definitely. I will. I will go to this area and, and keep an eye out and um, report back anything that I see. It's exciting. Perfect. It'll be, Fantastic. It would be exciting to get to see some some nesting going on. Perfect. And birthday. also keep an eye out, everybody, for the um, kestrel boxes, the five kestrel boxes oh, that yeah. were yeah. Yeah, yeah. put up around town. 
-hmm. one in, at, at Madison Field as well. So I'm sorry I missed that at the beginning of the meeting, but um, uh, I did want to make sure that you all were aware of that. Glad you remembered. Thank you, Delia. Thanks. Do I have a motion to adjourn? I make a motion to adjourn. Second. In the vote. Third. Okay. Aye. Nick. Aye. Judy. Aye. And Sarah. Aye. And I'm an eye as well. Thank you guys. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thanks so Good much. Good job, Ed.